Okay, I'd like to call the meeting to order, please. Um, roll call. Director Bernstein. Present. Director Crawley. Present. Director Carpenter. Present. Director Solano. Here. Director Jones. Here. Okay, we have the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> public comment number one. Is there anybody from the public who wishes to speak on any matter not on the agenda? Okay. Um, I'll move to uh, item number one, a cert report. Tom, are you prepared to do that? Yes, sir. Directors, good evening. Um, I'm Tom Pressing, the chair of the CCM CERT Executive Board, and this is our first report at the beginning of this year, which will be one of several during the course of the year. Um, our CCM CERT Executive Board expanded to 11 this year. Um, we have six active committees, IT, Education, Outreach, Drills, Communications, and Logistics. They meet monthly to coordinate their activities. Our 2018-19 budget was submitted for Budge and Mike, uh, Board and Michael Ralston review. Our current CERT class has 18 in it. Our uh, recent triage class on the 23rd of January had six. The EPA Get Ready uh, class occurs on the thir uh, third Thursday of each month and alternates uh, in Spanish, so the next Spanish Get Ready class will be in the third Thursday of March. We just had a CCM recognition party, good time was had by all, Chuck, you were there, we had 27 folks uh, who joined us. Monthly CERT meetings occur in Atherton on the first Saturday of each month, so we've already had two, and in East Palo Alto on the second Saturday of each month, of which we've had two. The Menlo Park CERT um, gatherings will begin in June as soon as we uh, are able to organize that effort. The first of three drills is the East Palo Alto Community Emergency Drill on March 10th at Faith Mem uh, Missionary Baptist Church. We already have 25 folks signed up from the community. This is an EPA police and city approved event. Uh, we have our first drill preparation meeting uh, this Thursday, February 22nd. In terms of, as you know, we are divided into 36 areas for CERT. The Atherton area coordinators are 12 of 16 areas. East Palo Alto is 5 of 6, and the Menlo Park, San Mateo County um, unincorporated areas are 5 of 14. We are reorganizing the San Mateo County uh, Menlo Park area coordinator uh, process, and that will be uh, implemented in June. In Atherton, nine of 16 EAPs have been installed, and we will be moving uh, to get together with the Menlo Park City Councils and, uh, and East Palo Alto City Councils and the necessary bodies to get the EAP proposals going in those communities. Uh, we've- Aaron Blackford, Aaron Blackford, to the advocate. And Mr. Lampert is being called. Uh, advertising in the Daily Post, the Daily Journal, and the Almanac have been completed for the first quarter of this year. And advertising in East Palo Alto Day, had, uh, East Palo Alto Today has been submitted uh, with Henrietta Burroughs. Matter of fact, I talked to her today. And we have arranged for times on the EPA Today TV program for both February and March. Matter of fact, Michael, Isaac, and uh, I believe Pastor Cowan is going to be in the uh, TV program this uh, Thursday night. We have also given presentations to the Atherton City Council and to the Menlo Park City Council as to what we are doing. The East Palo Alto Council presentation request will be made after the community drill. The proposed 2018 CCM CERT class schedule is approximately 56 but requires approval by our uh, CCM CERT Executive Board for effective volunteer coordination. We have a three class profile, Get Ready, Neighborhood Ready, and CERT Basic. 
These classes have been scheduled or are underway. We have a HAM GMRS communication class, a triage class, and an ISV, that's incident support vehicle class. They're in the mix. Other classes are in our hopper, but we do not have the resources yet to offer them in a comprehensive manner. As I mentioned before, we have approved as a board uh, three drills, the one in East Palo Alto on March 10th, the one in Menlo Park on the 23rd of June, and the one in Atherton on September 8th. The East Palo Alto and Menlo Park drills will be the second annuals of those two. The Atherton in September will be its third annual. Reorganization of the ADAP DRCs, those are uh, disaster res um, um, resource caches, are underway, and that's under the uh, guidance of Alan Douglas. In Atherton, the reorganization of the CERT DRCs is underway under the direction of Ramona Murray. We have outreach to Menlo College, Menlo High School, the Sacred Heart Schools, Vallambrosa Center, Nativity Church, St. Patrick's Seminary, the Menlo Church, the First Baptist Church of Menlo Park, Faith Missionary Baptist Church in East Palo Alto, St. Francis of Assisi in East Palo Alto, the Rotary Junior League, and the Menlo Park uh, Chamber of Commerce. In each of those, we have having varying degrees of development. Planning, implementing, and deploying the Menlo Park fire protection priorities given to us have begun, and they are reconnaissance and rapid damage assessment. We are redoing that because it takes place in all our drills and is a component of our CERT basic curriculum, which is being updated to improve its reporting effectiveness. Communication, oh, we are targeting CERTs and community members, and the budget for that has been submitted. Communications is covered also in our CERT basic. More comprehensive classes are currently taking place and are being upgraded. We are targeting CERT and HAM operators. Budget submissions are under review. CCM incident support and fire re rehabilitation is the third and last request of the uh, Menlo Fire. Class offerings have been scheduled and vehicle upgrades uh, are in our budget review. These activities are all improvements over last year. There's been some feedback from several quarters that we are not doing enough fast enough. As CCM CERT Executive Board Chair, I wish to address this. The number of classes in Spanish and English, literature in Spanish and English, and outreach in Spanish, English, and Pacific Islander languages have been cited as a few of our shortcomings. Documentation for all of our procedures, processes, and activities need to be created from scratch. And we do need more active members. These are accurate assessments. The 11, us, 11 of us on the board are all volunteers. Nine of the 11 have full-time jobs. Two of us have part-time jobs. And oh yes, we have families. Please note that the CCM CERT is also just a portion of our program director's description and responsibilities. As D Division Chief Stevens has reported to the EPREP committee and to you, we are rebuilding CCM CERT from the foundation up. This is the second year of a three-year endeavor to get us to a place where we can run our training, our drills, and our outreach in a manner, manner that does not end up with CERT burnout or CERT widow and widowers. The effective presentation of classes requires staffing, literature, locations, language translations, outreach, and requires our board to approve their quantity to ensure quality. More is not necessarily better. Drills require 20 hours of planning per week for the four weeks in advance of them to give the simulations the realism required. City officials, police departments, Menlo Fire, community certs, SMC certs, and neighborhoods all require communication and follow-up along with planning, pre-drill uh, activity reconnaissance, rehearsal, and drill execution. And process, procedure, and activity manuals are not, undertake, uh, are not undertakings that happen in a few months. Each one of these perceived shortcomings is being addressed by our CERT CCM executive board. And like a ship build, takes time and much effort. Please remember, we are a board that has to coordinate two cities 
a town, and three San Mateo County unincorporated areas. We are not Redwood City, and we're not Palo Alto. Lastly, because our resource limitations and, ta and the time it takes to bring ideas from planning to reality, we request that this report be given to you on a quarterly basis so that it has a true value of progress to you, the fire board. Our CCM legs are getting stronger. Our dedication is a marathon, not a sprint. Please be patient with us. We are following the direction of our program director, from his division chief, from his fire chief, and from you, the board. We are indeed succeeding. Thank you on behalf of the CCM CERT Executive Board. Any members have any questions for? Please have a comment about me. Please. Uh, Tom, I want to congratulate you personally and the rest of the board. I, I know how hard you guys work, but I've been nice to that. And I, see, I do see, you know, vast improvement over this last year. So I want to encourage you to continue to crack the whip and get them to keep them going, but not burn them out. Because that's, that's yes. the reality. And matter of fact, we made progress today in moving forward in two different areas of translation of um, documents uh, into Spanish. Where we have a real shortfall, obviously, is in the Pacific Islander languages, which, as you know, is four separate languages. And that's going to, that's going to be a very, very long haul for us to accomplish. But we are working on it. How are you going to do Talisa? Huh? Talisa? I, I, keep, I keep bugging her. I know. Okay. Um, Rob, go ahead. Yeah. I agree with Robert. I mean, the program's taken a 110 degree turn, um, not only with the with the board, but with our staff too, and uh, Chief Stevens and, and Mike's uh, participation. Is there a list of all the handouts that you give all of the CERT people? As a matter of fact, that's what we talked about this afternoon. Uh, I meet with Michael once a week. And so one of our topics today was putting together the exact list that we are going to go forward with as our official list of handouts for not only classes but events, drills, so that we have, we don't end up with 13 different documents that are varied, that we end up with a solid, let's say, six or seven, and that each of them at least will be in English and Spanish um, as a minimum. So yes, we are working on that. I think that would be a very valuable tool not only to serve people, but if we need it as a, as a resource to give it to other fire districts. And we've always talked about the DHS, mm -hmm. uh, to present it to DHS back in D.C. So I think that would be really helpful for us to have that. Mm -hmm. Just to let the, let the board know, uh, FEMA used to be able to provide us with documents. Uh, we have <coughs> applied several times now to get the documents from them, and they are not forthcoming. So what's happening is they're pulling back of providing um, CERT programs with the documents. So we're going to have to go in to uh, find them online, pull the PDF off, and print them ourselves. So that's going to be a little bit more time consuming because <coughs> FEMA DHS is no longer providing that service to uh, the CERT community. So it's, we're going to have to take it upon ourselves to uh, take care of that. Um, but as I'm also the outreach chairman, uh, that's one of our goals is to pull down those uh, PDFs where necessary, translate them into Spanish. We did find out a resource today that um, will allow us maybe to get those already in Spanish and move forward to that because that is um, uh, a shortcoming that was identified that we also identify in East Palo Alto and in uh, West Menlo is having that, those uh, documents in Spanish. Chief, that's like 25% like of your mission for DHS is to provide those type of documents. And I would really be interested if they're not providing to us that I'm sure we can call back here and shake some, some people uh, <coughs> and try to get us those, those documents that, that you want, Tom, and that might uh, well, we, yeah. well what, in talking to the folks back, uh, back in Washington. Just, uh, I, I think oh, we're off, off okay. topic here. We're trying to deal okay, with no, a, okay. a higher level. But, you know, um, uh, Rob, if you'd like to volunteer to uh, 
you have some contacts yourself. If you could do something, I think they would appreciate your help. Well, I think training is very important, and that's why I want to utilize all, all the training resources that, you know, not only that we have here, but, but through DHS. And I think reinventing the wheel kind of takes a lot of time from yeah, your actual functional uh, group. So uh, that's why I think it's important. I, I, I don't want you to think I don't support what you're saying. I'm paying for the training materials myself out of my own pocket to be able to distribute them when I do trainings in East Palo Alto because nobody has any materials. So it would be great if we could do something. It is important. We'll move forward on that. Uh, uh, go director. ahead, uh, Virginia. Tom, I just wanted to thank you and your, your team. Basically, it is a team effort for the work that you're doing. I know it takes a lot of time. And I've been getting your notifications. And I... You're doing a lot, a lot, a lot more is picked up, and I think it's fantastic. And anything that we can do to support y'all, um, let us know. Thank you, you Director. Great work. And thank, thank every, all the volunteers, because I know that they're putting in a lot of time, too. As a matter of fact, we're meeting on Thursday evening, and I will pass that on uh, to, to them. Tom, excellent report and a suggestion. I think working through Chief Shabalhaman, we can reach out to the Florida task forces, I can guarantee you they have those documents in Florida and Spanish. Okay. I'll work with you, okay. Chief. Is that okay with you, Chief? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, well, I'd be happy to reimburse you, Director, too, if you got caught. You can submit a receipt. We'll pay you for those. Oh, I, have, you out of pocket. I have a number of them. I'd be happy. It's all right. <laughs> well, you got receipts. We're good. <laughs> That shows you how committed Chuck is. <laughs> right. I don't even pay for the translator. I just through the door because it's coming out of his budget, so that's why he's yeah, that's what he <laughs> I paid for the translator to translate them into Spanish. Yeah, I paid for that too. Okay. Oh wow, what else we um, <laughs> Dan, are you here to make a benevolent association report? I'm not. I'm here to turn the speakers off. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> you don't want to hear any more announcements from no, the station. No, we don't. Is, is there anything, anybody from the benevolent association? No. Will they come later? Or? No, okay. Um, and um, I, I just want to mention as an agenda item, I think it should, instead of activities, I think it, is it the benevolent association activities? I'm not sure that's the exact right entry. This is how we... If you, che if you check on it, would you check on it, please? Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Fire Chief, uh, item number three. Yeah, Director, so you have my report in front of you. I'll just go through, I think, a, a number of points, so real quickly, just so you're up there, you can see that maybe, maybe better understand the significance. So starting with the City of Menlo Park, uh, the second item says all communications equipment previously located at Fire Station 1 has been relocated to the new 120-foot model pool at Menlo Park City Center. Uh, the city of Menlo Park uh, erected actually 119-foot model pool, similar to what we did in East Palo Alto. And, uh, you know, they allowed us, which we appreciate, to put our equipment on their pole. And that's kind of a big deal because, as you know, one of the struggles that we would have had would have been moving both their equipment, our equipment, the public works equipment, after these equipment, off of this building if we were going to be able to tear this down and rebuild it, which is what we're planning to do. So they're ahead of schedule on that. I think it's also a benefit that we've got a more uh, sustainable, robust, you know, piece of equipment in a 119-foot model pool. Um, the only thing we'll have to take a look at is how they store the communications equipment. I'm sure it's going to be down to some secure level. It never was here. I mean, it was sitting in a closet in the wood tower that when we did wet drills in the tower would create problems with the equipment. So, you know, it's a huge improvement, even though it's only, you know, a little bit more than a sentence in here. It's a big change in terms of our sustainability and having to be more robust. Um, also at the bottom there is the Palo Alto Fire Department. I know there's been some concerns about deployment with uh, Palo Alto and so forth, and we'll address that at a different time with the numbers. <coughs> but I met with the Mountain View Fire Chief today on a different issue, mostly related to search dogs and support of their search dogs and their issues that they have with uh, their ability to provide a search dog for the urban search and rescue team. We also discussed how all this model and what they see from their side, so I thought that was helpful as well. Uh, on item number, that's not number, on the item that says uh, primary response routes, I know the director partner wants to discuss that. Before I do that, um, we have the 100-year anniversary bells. I know 
Tim wanted to mention from a legal standpoint that we were able to do third party, right? You want to talk about the third party sale of uh, the anniversary bills? We didn't mention that in the email with me. Sure. Um, the issue came up about the sale of the bills and um, doing it by auction. And the question came up, I think um, Chief Long had uh, mentioned the purchasing policy that was in place. And so that purchasing policy, um, as is written, um, would, would need to be slightly changed right. um, to allow district officials and um, employees to acquire surplus property even through an auction. So then I left it to staff to determine what they thought was the best parameters for allowing that type of So we haven't picked an auction house yet, but we will be doing that shorter. As soon as, as soon as we do that, then we'll let you know. But the bottom line is, it's, it, it is doable. It can be done. We'll check with the council, and that's what we'll be doing. Under the uh, U.S. Drone Meeting, next slide, second page, very bottom, second sentence, it says, DJI will be featuring a demonstration of their new camera technology that sees through smoke on March 28th from 1030 to 1400 here at Station 1. Uh, you're all invited to that, so I want to make sure you understood and knew that. Uh, we have different fire agencies coming from all over to watch this demonstration. You can imagine, you know, not only is drone technology, you know, an amazing uh, move forward for the fire service, but this camera technology is also equally amazing. So, you know, you can literally see a smoky window. This camera can actually look inside and see if people are inside the building through the smoke. So that's the latest and cutting edge technology that's out there, and they're actually going to come here to uh, demonstrate that. We'll be able to uh, get a, a version of that so we can beta test it as well here. And finally, outside of, like I mentioned, the other item for primary response routes, on uh, the Urban Search and Rescue Program, uh, two things, the Administrative Readiness Evaluation, not Review. Uh, at the time when I wrote this, we had received our score last week. As you know, because I sent it to you, it was a very high score of 84.5%. We had evaluators from all of the United States and FEMA personnel here as part of a Tiger team that went through the cash of equipment, went through our records met with our staff, looked at capabilities, looked at training, looked at the warehouse, evaluated us on multiple fronts, including deployments and exercises and everything else. And uh, it was very successful, and we're pretty proud of that in terms of what we scored. And, and the biggest thing is we're fully deployable still, which is a good place to be for both the region and uh, the United States. Second part of that, too, is that you'll see as a desk item, but it will come up a little bit later, is you have the amended, or actually the, the, now the real contract with the state of California. So, and, and we'll get to that tonight, I just talked about that before the meeting. But as you may know already, and if the audience doesn't know, is that the state is conducting a uh, exercise in March. And part of that exercise for three of the teams in the north and five in the south uh, will be uh, essentially a USAR research rescue deployment into Sacramento, uh, into an area where there's going to be a radioactive dispersal device simulation along with the typical collapse structure portions that we do. So this is, this is not new. We've done some of this already, but obviously you can imagine uh, all the way from the governor's office, there's an enhanced concern about a rat event. And so this exercise puts into play uh, some of the national assets and the state assets to go in and work with the National Guard who's also going to be very significantly involved in this type of a, an event if it were to ever occur. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but again, I want to get back to the primary response routes if there are none, or answer whatever questions you have. Could you address, please, we have a, a communication here that seems to relate to it. Is this part of this? So you know the OES agreement, or? No, no, no. there's the uh, consider, Primary. this is from 2011. Right, so I know Director Carpenter had brought this up. We had not put it on the agenda in the way in which the board could discuss it as a discussion item, but he had asked that this be addressed. So I thought during the chief's discussion, if you want to give me any direction. The bottom line, the last time we looked at the primary response routes was back in 2011. You guys, essentially, the board said, you know, there's going to be a, a resolution out of this. They were accepted. We can certainly revisit those. We can certainly discuss which ones are applicable or not applicable any longer, problematic, I think is where Director Carpenter is coming from, and 
and quite honestly, some of these things at the time when they were done in 2011 yeah. was to slow down traffic control devices, the different features that the cities were per putting in to, to do traffic calming. Um, we've been somewhat successful in other areas, not very. I mean, so when you reduce lanes down uh, from four to two or six to two, um, I'm sorry, six to three, uh, I'm sorry, six to four, <coughs> then you end up with different problems. We have the widening of bicycle lanes or the state law that was put in place with the buffer zone for bicycle lanes. You actually have buffer bicycle lanes. You have jurisdictions because of the traffic issues now with the ability to monitor traffic or because of construction, other projects and just congestion and backup number of vehicles, good economy. You know, a lot of things have changed since 2011. I think this was a good step. But it's not the only step. I think that's what Director Carpenter wanted to say a few words about. You know what else we could do. So it's time to review it. It's time to see what else can be done. And every jurisdiction is having this as part of their, you know, annual review of what projects they're doing or things that are important to them, which is, you know, traffic. Peter, would you like to address it? Yeah. Um, the board uh, made a decision in the January meeting to put this on the February agenda. It was an oversight that it didn't appear here. Uh, let me be very clear about what the intention is. Um, consistent with the policy of designating emergency response routes, uh, it is my belief, and the purpose of this coming on the discussion before the board, is that some of our primary response routes are virtually unavailable to us because of traffic congestion. Uh, we as a fire board have no control over that. And so the purpose of having this on the agenda is, I believe, that we have an obligation to inform each of the jurisdictions involved where we are having a problem and asking for their assistance and direction to help solve that problem. Um, and there is no record of communications between this board and the jurisdictions saying, Hey, folks, we've got a problem. We talk about it all the time, but we've never put it on the record. So that's the purpose of the discussion that we were going to have tonight, but which we'll now have in March. I, I want to ask the chief a question related to this. Do we have any standard? I, I'm not in any way taking issue with what Peter said, but I'm trying to understand. Is there any standard for what constitutes a problem or when a route is impacted and when it's OK? Standard? No. Uh, typically, I'll, you know, on behalf of the board, but certainly I think what Director Carpenter is proposing is to notch it up. You know, I'll go to the city managers, I'll respond to different projects and different things that the cities are doing. Uh, Tim and I have done that in their general plans. We've made, you know, kind of larger statements and so forth within their planning and guidance documents or on specific proposals for building a project that it's going to have a negative effect. A good one there would be the recent Stanford general use permit and the impacts to traffic. Uh, we'll attend meetings, as some of the directors know. Uh, we'll stand up for different issues based upon the district's position. But at the end of the day, we're not in charge of the roads. We need the roads. You know, we're probably the biggest thing outside of a semi-delivery truck on the road. And we behave differently than that because we end up, most of the time these days, we're just going against traffic and the opposite the lane of travel. So. You know, there's been great projects. The city of Melville Park should be complimented for Santa Cruz Avenue and the turn lane that goes all the way up it. That's a great way for us to move up and down Santa Cruz Avenue. Willow Road, which is, I know, one of the roads that Director Carpenter has referenced in the past, and I will tell you it's a problem. In fact, it's such a big problem that uh, the city of Melville Park Police Department doesn't use it anymore during certain times of the day. They go down Marshall. Road. That might be information for some people in this room, but it's not new to us. I mean, when a city gives up on a route that is the most direct way in which they can reach some parts of their community and has to take another route, you got a big problem. So, you know, the effective size of the force there is one way to solve it during periods of the day. Um, just in general, you know, the, the roads are only part of the solution, but everything about the road impacts how we perform, how we respond. And the other part of this is, and I'll even remember the number on this, you have resolution 1818 as a performance standard. That means that within the 90th percentile, we look at all call volume and see if we're meeting that mark on behalf of the community. Chief Long and I are going to look at that for this last year because we're supposed to report back to you, which we will on where performance is. But I think recently in one of the discussions that we had, which is a good way to look at it too, you know, 90% is great, 
but where are we not making the mark and why? And so is that a crew performance issue? Is that an alert, alert notification issue? Is that they didn't push a button issue? Or is it quite honestly, we just can't get there from here very quickly because there's just no way to, to do it. It's a road condition. It's a design issue. It's taking something and narrowing it down. There's all, you know, again, we're not the only ones that use the roads, but we like to think that we're important. And that includes the police department. That includes the ambulances as well. So, you know, there's not, there hasn't been a broader discussion on this, I think, with our involvement. It probably needs to be. And I think that was also part of Director Carpenter's you know, thought behind this, is to, is to make sure we're included. And again, many times we're not. Okay, Virginia? So, Harold, um, so this is obviously an old attachment. With the, how did y'all determine these were primary response routes at that time? I mean, it sounds like you, you mean, you touched on it a little bit, but like, I'm looking at this, it's an alphabetical order, and Alameda del Pogas isn't even on here. And not that it has to be on here based on this report well, at that time, that but. That may be an oversight, but it's not, but I think it's, it's more for the primary. Well, because as you know, we're dealing with that very issue at the Y, Santa Cruz, Alameda, Y, which is... As soon as engine four makes a right or a left, they're on the road. Right, okay. So, so um, do you think that the information that you and Don will have for the 2017 data, how, well, how different do you think it will be from this? Well, we'll make adjustments. You know, we'll have to look at it. I mean, you know, for example... Now that we've allowed and agreed to bicycle routes on Oak Grove yeah. Avenue, do we want to use Oak Grove beyond El Camino? Well, El Camino is not on the You know, Ravenswood is also constricted yeah. because of the dividers that they put in. We can knock them off. You know, that's, that's another thing we'll look at. We'll look at what's been done. You know, what, what, are, the, what are the changes? I mean, Santa Cruz Avenue, as I mentioned, is, is more robust, better than it used to be. You know, Alameda, based on what's being proposed, may or may not in certain sections mean that we try and take a different route. Um, you know, Willow heading, heading down from Middlefield is terrible. Unless yeah. it gets fixed, you know, there's only so much you can do. And I think, you know, we'll look at downtown Menlo Park as well. Because maybe it isn't reasonable anymore to think that that's a route we could go through. You have to bypass it. But, you know, as you know, it's already a problem on our road. So, you know, we need to look at what's being done as well. And anywhere we put ourselves into conflict with pedestrians, bicyclists, vehicles and parking, like the downtown, maybe we just scratch that off the list because that's just not a very smart way to go. There's got to be a bypass around all that. So, you know, I can tell you in the old days, we used to respond like that. It wasn't a problem. Everything's changed. Right? And in downtown, you know, I know a lot of people are hoping that downtown Mellow Park is going to become more vibrant. So that's a good thing for the merchants. not going to be that great of a thing with traffic stacked up if we try and use it. Now, the good news is there's ways around that. So, but the bad news is there's only so many. But there's not right ways around other types of roadways that we have. So, yeah, I think we're just, we're going to look at it from a different set of, you know, eyes at a different time. That, again, in 2011, it looked a lot different. Remember, we're coming out of a recession. There weren't a whole lot of people on the roads at that time. I know, but like, the, we had Middlefield Road on here, Alameda's not on here. And El Camino is not on yeah, here. Because, because it could be that it was so, just so plain in your face that we didn't I know, but I think we have to spell it out in light of this well, road sharing So at the time, issue. I don't think any of us ever thought anybody would mess with those roads because right. it would be insanity to do that. Well, I'm but saying that make sure now, so. that they're on here, yeah, we'll uh, on the new form. Yeah, okay. Because as you know, the, the public policy outlook is changing for even what we consider major primary response routes, including a state highway, El Camino. Yeah, well, no one ever assumed that the state highway would change. Yeah. So. Okay, thanks. Rob, did you have any comments? Uh, no. Robert? <coughs> Just two questions, uh, mainly exploration. 90% is great. Uh, what I would like to know is, is it broken out by cities? I assume that the, the, the data is broken out by, by cities. And also, the other aspect of that, did you track it by, by streets in terms of when you have your, however you came up with 90% it was based on something? And is that- Industry standard. Just industry standard, yeah. okay. 
And so and we can typically we track by station and unit, but you know the details all the way down to the call number and the call itself. So we'll know what the address that they responded to. It gets a little bit more difficult based upon the route that they may take. But you know, nevertheless, we'll try and figure out that's part of the part of the problem. They'll they'll be asked typically when they don't meet standard through dispatch, they're asked for routing. So there is a record on how they chose to go to a call. And and you'll hear them sometimes if you listen to the radio, delayed by train. You know, as we get more train trips without the track crossing, that's another one that's going to be, you know, more delay is that you're sitting there waiting for the train to go by. Uh, stuck in traffic is another one. You know, there's a lot of different things that happen that delay the, the unit from its response. You know, I would love to see that that data, that information, in, in particular over the last five years, maybe go back to 10, these fell out, so I know for sure has changed. Trying to go east to west uh, in the morning and in the afternoon become a real challenge. Yeah. And you go north and south, you can bust right through the traffic. But to go those routes in both morning and afternoon, so I'm curious to see what what issues that are really besides you know, knocking people off of some of the uh, the smaller street, not the main street, because we only got one to go right down the city, but all these other little streets that people have learned how to get to. Well, I mean, you know, you still have to put in traffic control devices without really talking to us at times too. So. You know, sadly, that's been happening. It's happened in different places. The good news, for example, Appleton, we're having that discussion about what would be appropriate. So we end up with speed hop slumps that don't have the brakes for the tires sometimes. I mean, Pebble Park was the worst. Our last survey on that was 305 different devices in the district that slowed the fire trucks down. Some of those are natural. The trees that didn't, you know, nobody wants to cut down. They're in the middle of the roadway. They were there before the road was built. So. They stayed, but in other places, it's you know it's all man-made. It's been inserted in there. So, I'll be curious to see uh, when we get to this next month. The good news for East Palo Alto is the engines out there, 77 and 2, pretty much stay out there. The other stations on the other side of the freeway, typically because there's not a, a, side, a large enough effective force, have to come into East Palo Alto versus they come out. Mm -hmm. So that's you know that does help it. And, you know, you probably see the videos we've made, and you know, we're going down East Palo Alto or the Dumbarton Bridge or whatever. You're going against opposite traffic. There's just nowhere for it to go. I mean, every one of these jurisdictions that put in trees and curbs and planters and all these different things that make it look nice, they kill us. I see it every cut right out my look out with my I'm sure you do. You hear the siren peaked out, they're going down the wrong side of the road, which is which is a liability. I wish I could tell you that it's super safe. It's not safe. I mean, they're being as safe as they can be, but that's what we've come to, you know? And I mean, you can, I don't care what size you make it, it doesn't fit. I mean, even a motorcycle's got its problems. We're going to a lot of motorcycle accidents all the time by people who think they know how to ride a motorcycle real well until somebody zigs when they should have zigged or zagged, and next thing you know, they're laying on the ground, so. Okay, I look forward to that. See you then. I had two, or three comments actually. One is, um, it, it seems from your discussion that we're not going to be talking to cities about specific routes here. We're going to be talking about this in general. No, no, no. That's not my that's motion. Not what asked. My motion is that we identify, right. using this as background, right. we identify those specific problems we're aware of Willow, Marsh, Four Lane, El Camino, and Menlo Park. Alameda. Um, and that's what we'll have yeah. a discussion about. Yeah, and then we notify our partner agencies saying, hey folks, we got a problem. So and we have no control over it. This is background information. This is not the subject for, that we have to put on the agenda. Okay. Right. Right. okay. I, so I are, are you asking, are, 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 is, is some research going to be done before the next meeting to, yeah, to that's document fine. that? Is that? My, I, Exchange emails with the chief this afternoon. It's my hope that we will be presented with draft letters to each of the jurisdictions, and in those letters, we will identify those particular emergency response routes which we have a very serious problem with. And then we can have a discussion about whether or not we want to proceed with that. That's the intention. Okay. You said motion. As far as I know, you haven't made a motion yet. No, I no, can't. there's no I can't. motion. It's okay. not an agenda. No, because item. we don't have the right. Okay. Right. I said the, what I discussed with the chief this afternoon is that at the March meeting, right. 
The board packet will have draft letters to be signed by the board president to each of the jurisdictions identifying the critical problem or problems that we have regarding emergency response routes in their jurisdiction. And we as a board will decide whether or not we want to do that and whether or not those are the right routes. Okay. Question. I, there, were, there were two. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Reverend. Well, A, the letter is great, uh, but I, you know, I think it's, in order for me to kind of kind of get behind it, I really need to see data, the data that I was asking for or, or suggesting. I, I mean, I'd be willing to come over here and sit down and look at it before a letter gets drafted saying, okay, this is what, what it needs to be done. Now, I trust your judgment, but it would be nice to know my constituency, folks in my neighborhood, when they call on me with a certain uh, clarity on an issue or why, I need to know, have the data to do so. It would be helpful. That's exactly the kind of thing that's always included in a staff report. Right. You know, so. It may not be I mean, 10 years, because we've only standard, 1818 is only been around for a few, but. Yeah, we can give Well, I'm looking forward to the information you bring back in March. Well, I remember what's changed too is we passed, you know, basically Palo Alto was very generous to right. us and allowing us to go through their city. University, yeah. Well, the problem with that now is they've got their, they've reduced their traffic as well on that side. So, you know, it, it, again, it was a good idea, not necessarily the right thing to do that we're traveling through somebody else's jurisdiction to get to <coughs> Palo Alto, but we need to get there, you need to get there. But they've also addressed their own traffic issues, which now, kind of counteract part of our ability to go through the jurisdiction that is a benefit. So can you, you get stuck in Palo Alto, you're not in your jurisdiction, you get stuck in Menlo Park, you know, pick one. Being stuck is not good. I, I wanted to mention two resources, and Don, I, I wanted to mention it to you. I, I don't know if we're able to make use of it, but um, I'm blanking on the name right now. But I have, for when I bicycle, I have a, an, an app that tracks all those routes and the time that it takes. I don't know if we're able to track it. The way is it here? Well, but this is an app for bicyclists, basically, cyclists. Um, I'm not familiar with what you're uh, talking about. Okay, because it just seemed to me that we might want to start tracking a little bit more. The other thing I was going to say is that on March 6th, the city of Palo Alto is having a meeting related to this um, study they just did of the cost of undergrounding the train. And um, the, the, the front page on the post was, oh, it's too expensive. I was shocked at how cheap it was. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a couple billion dollars. It's not nothing. But given the costs of all the other intersections and raising and all the other problems we've got, and the lives lost, and the cars that are turned, the, their navigation systems are telling them to drive down the railroad tracks and all this kind of stuff, it seemed to me very it's a clear route. Yeah. <laughs> it seemed very inexpensive, and, and it seemed to me, we, I, I'm basically suggesting, I think it would be a good idea if you go, I plan to go, and I think it would be good for us to understand. One of the big costs was that when they meet Menlo Park, they'd have to then get to grade again. And, and, and I'm saying, no, we'll cooperate, and we'll try to do something where we can meet you underground or something. So I, I think there's some opportunity for some cooperation here, and March 6th is, is the day. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other? Uh, well, one last thing. So on that, I mentioned. So you know, in 2011, there was no such thing as an app on your phone that you could navigate from, right? So all the shortcuts that the firefighters, because they all memorize the streets during probation. Obviously, when you're a driver, it's even more important for driving. But all the ways that we know how to get around town. Pretty much everybody else knows too. So when they stack up, they take the shortcuts that we used to use, which now we get as stuck as they are only on a smaller street in a residential neighborhood. So. Okay, thank you. Um, item um, number uh, four, the um, comprehensive annual financial report. Thank you so much. Uh, again, uh, my name is Ken Poon. Uh, I'm the managing partner of the Poon Group, uh, also the engagement partner to audit the Menlo Park Fire Protection District for year end June 30, 2017. Instead of having you read through the whole entire uh, CAFR, I basically did some highlight for you. So what we are going through today is as required by the auditing standard. We are, uh, we are communicating with those charged with governance, basically is the board here. So we'll go through the scope of work, uh, the audit responsibilities, 
uh, the approach to the audit so that we can fulfill our res audit responsibility. Going through uh, the financial statement, uh, the financial indicator, and some key pension information that I would like to show you. And last but not least is to go through the audit results. The scope of work. The district actually engaged us to do the, the following three things. Uh, the first one is the financial statement audit, uh, basically include is the uh, um, comprehensive annual financial report, and our part to audit is the uh, basic financial statement within the uh, CAFR. Uh, the compliance audit, uh, since the district has expended more than $750,000 of uh, federal expenditure, so the single audit is also required to make sure that those are in compliance. Last but not least is uh, to have a agreed upon procedures um, to recalculate the GAN limit that the board adopted for the year. So let's go through the audit responsibility. As management yourself, you are fully responsible for the financial statement by presenting these financial statements in accordance with generally accepted accounting principle. Uh, the district is a municipal government, so that's why the gov uh, government, uh, government accounting standard board Board is the standard setting bodies for state local governments. So the district is actually adherence to those uh, regular uh, to those um, accounting principles. You also need to adopt sound accounting policy. The next bullet point is very important that you, you establish and maintain proper internal control over financial reporting and compliance. Uh, while we are here uh, to provide the uh, evidence supporting to the amount and the disclosure in the financial statement. And last but not least, you do need to have programs to prevent and detect fraud. Our responsibility, uh, we are basically performing these audit uh, complying with two standards. One is the AICPA generally accepted auditing standard and then also from the GAO uh, government auditing standard. Um, we are here to communicate with those shops with governments, uh, assess audit risk of internal control over financial reporting and compliance, determine the fairness presentation of these financial statements, and last but not least is to render our audit opinions. The, op the approach to the audit is actually based, uh, divided into four phases. The planning phase is basically throughout the whole entire audit. We look at the, uh, the, um, <coughs> the um, transactions throughout the year, uh, identify some new accounting standard that needs to be implemented during the year, and then come up with the audit work plan. Uh, phase two, we come here to uh, evaluate the internal control. So basically during this phase of the audit, we talk to your accounting personnel, um, mainly talk to uh, Kathleen and her team, uh, looking at the, uh, the, the processes, the accounting processes, which include financial reporting, how you um, uh, record your, your revenue, how you actually um, um, uh, maintain your vendor files, uh, payrolls files. Those are the things that we look at during the phase two of the audit. Based on our audit results of the uh, phase two of the audit, we determined the district is a low risk oddity. Basically, we are able to rely on your internal control. Um, third phase is validation of the account balance. Um, the, the, the higher the risk, the, the more that we have to test. So since you are a low risk oddity, we are actually can be, uh, we are actually be able to make our audit um, of the account balance, making sure that those are very efficient process. A validation of account balances, looking at the uh, reconciliation, looking at the uh, uh, third party's confirmation, uh, making sure that uh, everything's are in line with the uh, accounting record. Last but not least is to review the financial statement and issue our audit opinions. Uh, the brief overview of these financial statements, um, the, the uh, District actually uh, complete a comprehensive annual financial report, and basically, this report has submitted to GFOA for the certificate of achievement uh, for excellent financial reporting. So, uh, the first introductory sections is a little introduction of the district. Those are the standard um, information within the uh, within the introductory sections. And congratulate to the um, to the district last for last year financial statement. You do get the um, certificate of achievement for excellent financial reporting from GFOA. Second, uh, the main focus on our end is on the financial section. So the first item is the independent auditor's report, which actually is our opinion on these financial statements. Second um, document within the section is the management discussion and analysis. Even though you see this is an audit um, documentation, but actually the information provides you uh, what's going on, what's the story between 
uh, be, uh, behind those numbers and what are the, uh, the, the current transactions compared to cur from current year to prior years. The basic financial statement is like exactly what we audited. The, include the government-wide financial statement. Actually, this is the uh, consolidated financial statement of the district. The fund financial statement, which include the general fund, the debt service fund, the special revenue funds, and the capital projects fund, those are the ones that you actually formally adopt the budget for each of the funds. And basically, those are your main operating funds of the cities. The notes to the basic financial statement give you a little bit more detail, uh, making sure that um, it's in compliance with GAAP. The request supplementary information, it's after GASB uh, statement number 34 being implemented about like 15 years ago. The request supplementary information do give you uh, budgetary information on the, um, on the general fund and the special revenue fund, and at the same time, give you more information about the pension and OPEP. So GASB 68 implemented about like three years ago. There is a uh, two new schedule. Basically, it start accumulate in the required supplementary information, so that you can see the trend of the of the uh, the, pe the the pension, how it looks like for compared to years to years, and then also other post employment benefit. Supplementary information is other information um, that is not a major required under the GASP standard. So those information are, are in, included in the supplementary information. The statistical sections basically do provide you a lot more detailed information about uh, the past trend uh, for about like 10 years of information regarding your financial trend, your cap uh, revenue capacity, the debt capacity, some demographic information, and then other operating, operating information. So kind of give you a, a, a summary of what we have so far um, as of June 30, 2017. This is the uh, government-wide um, statement of net position. In another word, this is the balance sheet of the, uh, of the, um, of the district. As of June 30, 2017, you have $111 million in total asset. Um, liability, $60.6 million, resulting a net position of $61 million. As you can tell, there are two elements, which include the deferred outflow of resources and deferred inflow of resources. Those are the elements that's really mainly coming from the, uh, the pension standard, those uh, actuarial items that are, have not been used during the current year and recognized as pension expense, those will be recognized in the future. So some of them is actually include in your deferred outflow resource. That's another term that I use is kind of like the prepaid items. $17 million. And then defer inflows of resource is kind of like uh, uh, something that um, it's kind of like an unearned. So $6.3 million. So the net position is the net equity of the district. So the, there are three categories. The net investment in capital assets, $27 million. Uh, mainly it's um, your capital asset nets of the related debt. Um, the restricted, $1.1 million, um, and then the unrestricted is $33.5 million. You do not have a deficit because majority of this, the, the district that I, I go to, once they implement the, uh, the pension standard, the unrestricted portion always goes, like majority goes to a deficit position, which means that this, uh, the district, the Menlo Park 5 Protection District, you have a really strong financial position here. Let's take a look at the income statement for the year. Total expenses, $43.5 million, net of program revenue. So the program revenues are those charges for service, operating grants and capital grants, total of $3.5 million. So the net cost of service is close to $40 million. So the general tax, uh, general revenue, which include all the property tax, the, the, the re redevelopment um, tax coming in, $45.7 million some other miscellaneous and investment earnings of about another $1.3 million. So the change in net position, there is a surplus of $7 million for the current, uh, for the fiscal year at June 30, 2017. The general fund is always the main operating fund, so I pull, pull it out and take a look at the general fund. Um, total asset, $42 million. Uh, total liabilities, uh, $2.4 million. Another deferred inflow of resource that has not met the uh, revenue recognition in the fund level, um, $658,000. So the fund balance is actually $38 uh, point, uh, close to $39 million. Um, dollars. 
Um, of that, uh, 3.6 are really non-spendable. Those are actually prepaid item and inventory that you have and basically cough it up because the, the district already spent those money out. The committed 22.3 uh, $22 million dollars of uh, within the $22 million, you do actually have some rainy days fund uh, uh, um, that, that is set aside of about like $18 million. Uh, assigned fund balance, $13 million, and then, re resulting, and then the unassigned $44,000, so, which is a really, really good um, uh, healthy reserve for the, uh, for the district. Um, revenue, $48 million for the general fund. Um, the total expenditure, $42.8 million. Dollars. Um, majorities are paying vendors, paying the uh, the salaries, resulting in a um, uh, before the uh, transfer out and some proceeds from the south of property, you have about like close to six million dollars in uh, in operating income. Uh, the transfer out of eight point four million dollars. Those are um, the transfer out to your capital projects funds of seven point five million dollars to buy the land and some, and to fund some capital projects. And then the other um, um, couple hundred thousand dollars is actually uh, transferred to the debt service fund to pay the debt service. So that's why you see a, a, a change in fund balance of two point five million dollars um, uh, negative. So. Some financial key, uh, indicator and key pension information that I would like to pull that out for you. So one of the things that I look at is the net cost of service compared, compared to tax revenue. So the net cost of service, as I said earlier, is about like $40 million. Tax revenue, $45 million. Um, you know, basically, control costs really, really good. Because take a look at it. Uh, every dollar, tax dollar that you come in, you only spend 87, um, uh, 87 cents. Um, some of the information that I would like to pull that out, um, which is the net pension liability. This is a uh, hot topics in the industry um, that everybody's talking about how how the pensions liability may affect your 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 district. So keep that in mind. The uh, the valuation is always two two years behind. So the valuation as a that we put it in the report is actually as of June 30, 2015, but that numbers has been like, there's some actuarial roll forward. This, this number is basically based on a measurement date and value as a 7.5% uh, discount rate. So the liability reported on the face of financial statement is about like $41 million. So CalPERS actually last year did approve to drop the discount rate from 7.5 to 7% in the next three years. So that's why um, everybody needs to keep that in mind. So the pension liability is going up and then all, so does the, uh, so do the, um, the uh, contribution um, to the uh, to the uh, to, to the plan itself. It's also going up too. So the post-employment benefit plan, uh, which is the retiree health care plan, um, you do actually have a irrevocable trust set aside. So the last valuation that was done was as of June th uh, uh, July 1st of 2015. During that date, you, you do have about close to $5 million in total actuarial value of asset. Total liabilities of uh, $9.2 million, resulting in $4.3 million of unfunded um, OPEP liabilities. Um, these OPEP liabilities have not been recorded on the face of the financial statement. This is the upcoming new OPEP standard needs to be implemented in 2018. So as you can tell, if there's an unfunded pension li OPEP liability, those will be bringing back to the, uh, to the uh, face of, a, of the financial statement. So. Um, the district also spent about like uh, more than seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in um, federal expenditure. So we are also required to go through the uh, the single wallet act, um, making sure that you are in compliance with uh, federal laws and spending the money in the in the appropriate ways. So the this, the district actually have do have one um, one program is the national urban search and rescue response system. Uh, this year you spend about like one million dollars. Since you only have one program, we test hundred percent of this program, and we do not have any findings from from um, f uh, from the audit. So the audit results um, this is the really good um, that we are able to obtain sufficient audit evidence to opine on our on these financial statement and the uh, and the compliance saying that. Uh, 
we are issuing an unmodified opinion. That means the financial statement are fairly present in all material respects. Significant accounting policy have been consistently applied. Estimates are reasonable and the disclosure are properly reflected in these financial statements. We do not have any disagreement with management. There's no accounting issues. Um, accounting principles have been consistently applied. Um, no material weaknesses or significant deficiency in internal control over financial reporting or compliance and no material irregularities discovered. So that's conclude my presentation tonight and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Okay, Robert, do you have any questions? Rob? Uh, I just want to say uh, with the recommendations, Kathy, nice job, Chief, nice job with the final uh, results of the audit. Uh, we have, involving the pension liability, approximately we have about $41 million. Mm -hmm. And our reserves are what, 45, something like that? Um, split out differently, yeah, we have about, what is it, 40, I want to say 48 million. Okay, so that's, that's if CalPERS ever, if if CalPER ever came to task, we could pay off our, our pension liabilities if we had to juggle all our different accounts and everything. Would that be reasonable to say? Um, yeah, I think that's reasonable. Except that, you know, I mean, the... the I know, the different funding yeah, sites and everything, we have to adjust. The but reserves are real, and that would, you know... Right, but if we, if we came to task, we, we have the financial resources to go to take care of that huge, tremendous bill that we have in our district. We're in bit, let me just put it this way, we're in a lot better shape than Most. other places. Yeah. Well, than many, right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Jack. That's all. Okay, Virginia? Well, I just want to thank Kathy for a great job, and Harold, too, but really the Poon group. Y'all have been amazing since we've hired you, and I know that we continued your services for other things, too. Thank so you. Thank you for working with us. So there's one more person not the room, but Chief Navarro. Do you have Amy Carrasco working on the oh, program? Oh, so thank Amy for us, too, because yeah, I know Amy's, that she's... Amy's the one that, you know, even the feds called out in the audit that they just did. And, you know, her that, practices are... That she's done a great job. Well, they followed yeah. some of the practices that she set up or, you know, benchmarks for the, for the nation in all 2018. Well, thank her for us, too. Because that's a whole oh, separate thing. That, yeah. And also, let's mention Long Lamb. He's yeah, Long. phenomenal. Yeah. Well, your whole team is, I think, been really great. So, yeah. I could just one comment. Uh, there's a number of evaluations we're done by the program office. Uh, there's 20 points available on financials, uh, the use of program. And Amy was able to secure 20 out of 20. Oh, it was one fantastic. Uh, finding a recommendation that she actually has too much documentation. <laughs> She's got more documentation than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Plus the other the other issue that uh, was a best practice last time we were on, and I think we're on it again, is that we turn over and spend it uh, and reconcile that in two weeks, which most programs don't. They wait several months for the quarter. Um, and the feds like to see that. They, they like to see it from the general comment office that the money that's there is actually being spent and spent in program. Thanks, yeah. man. Some of these programs want years yeah. without spending the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, tell her great job. Peter? Yeah. Um, first, I'd like to echo the <clears throat> comments of my colleagues. This is a great tribute to the staff. And for those of you who don't have a chance to pay attention to it, it's not that often that public agencies get clean audits like this. Uh, you know, we've all seen the difficulties that Mental Park's gone through, etc. Uh, year after year, um, our staff has performed and performed exceedingly well, and I really welcome the fact that we have somebody from the outside come in, looks at it from a totally professional, distance standpoint, and say, hey folks, it's being done right. So thank you very much for great job, staff. Um, 
I'd like to echo the, I think we have done a good job on it. I have a couple questions sure, I'd like to just sure. understand a little bit better. Could you go back to slide number 19 for a second? Do you have that page number? Oh, I'm sorry. That's page... Um, oh, here, I see. Page, I think it's page, it's page 10. 10. Yeah. The top of page 10. The top of page 10. You have it. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, it's that the, one right there. Pension okay. liabilities. Pension liabilities, yeah. yes. My question is, if we were using the 7% discount rate today, okay. you, are you able to estimate what that 40, how much more that 40 million would be? Okay, first of all, I'm not an actuary, but one nice thing that Gatsby actually did put it into this report is the sen sensitivity analysis. So it's plus one and minus one percent. Uh, it is really, uh, let me go back to the report itself. Uh, it is actually be shown in pa on page 75 of the uh, of the CAFR, and in, like because. Drop it down to seven percent. I won't be able to give you the approximate number, but if you actually drop like one percent to six point five, your number is going up to sixty-one million dollars. Sixty-one. So we could, if if we just went in between the two. In between the two. Linear. Yes. It's fifty million dollars. Around somewhere between like forty and like probably fifty million dollars. I'll, I'll have to say that that would be appropriate. Yeah. Okay. So I I wanted to just kind of respond to Rob's. Thing. He put Kathy, I think, on the spot here. But this fluctuates a great deal. First of all, in my opinion, 7% is way too high anyway. It should be about 5%. Mm -hmm. If it were 5%, this number might be $80 million, $70 million. I'm, I don't believe we're OK in terms of our pension liability and I just didn't want to leave it. This has no nothing to do with the accounting quality or the work of the Clune Group or the work of Kathy and her team. It's it's the problem we have with yeah. CalPERS mm -hmm. and they are a wild card yeah. and we're still not paying our own way. I'm just saying this number it wouldn't be doubled, but it would be sixty, seventy million dollars. We're essentially bankrupt at that point. And we're the best of all. We're better than many. Yeah. So that, that's why we always recommend the district, all my clients, to proactively dealing with the uh, the situation. Like for example, you do have two plans. Like I'm not too worried about the miscellaneous plan, but the safety plan, the contribution rate. It's going like basically for whatever plan, by the year 2024 and 25, you're expecting everything to be double. So if you what, double. double double your contribution. So if you are paying about like um, um, 35% currently, you probably will pay about like 70% by, by the year end um, 2025. Those are the estimates that's coming from, from CalPERS. Um, and also there's a couple factors. It's all depending, depending on the investment earnings um, portfolio, how they perform in the next couple years. Because in the last five years, it's been poorly done. It's below 7.5%, and only one year, which is last year, they are, they are able to coming back at 12 point something percent. So, um, so there are a lot of strategy um, to deal with pension liability. So instead of waiting to 2025, you probably need to deal with that now. Yeah, Great. that's you. my recommendation. That, that was the point I wanted to make. I think yeah. this is important. It's important to me as one yeah. of the things that I've been unhappy about for the last four or five years. And right. We have this record stock market, you know, mm -hmm. 26, 27 percent return. Right. And CalPERS just isn't doing it. Right. I mean, who knows what's going to happen when the market turns down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was really the question I wanted to ask. You're Any welcome. other things before we leave this? Thank you very much. For Thank, the you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Okay. Where are we here? Where are we going? Okay, we've, we've come to the consent calendar, um, and this is quite a few items here, items 5 through 20, um, and I'm going to ask, uh, let me make it be able to write this down, uh, anybody want to pull anything off the uh, consent calendar at this point? Rob? Yep, uh, 5, 14, 15, and 16. 5, 14, what? 15 and 16? Yep. Mm -hmm. 5, 14, 
15 and 16. And what about Robert? Um, Robert, did you have anything you wanted to pull off? Let me circle these things, Rob, just one second. 5, 14, 15, 16. Okay. Of Virginia? Um, 18. Uh, 18. Okay. Um, and Peter? No. Um, the ones that I want to pull off uh, were, oh, I want to pull off number 13. That's one that nobody mentioned. I also had 14, 15, and 18. So um, I move to accept the consent calendar with those items accepted. Second. So, okay. Um, it's been moved and seconded. And the items that are circled, just to be clear, that, that we're going to remove, we're going to remove five. 13, 14, 15, 16, and 18. Did I miss anybody? No. Nope. Okay. Any, um, any discussion on the motion to approve the consent calendar? Nope. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Five. okay, let's start then with number five. We'll do them in order. Uh, Rob, uh, this was the minutes of the meeting? Right. On, uh, we'll get our joint meeting. Uh, my comment in there, uh, when we had talked about uh, traffic enforcement and the problems uh, that we have relative to not only traffic devices, but traffic control for routes and response, I had mentioned that you know, us as a fire district don't have any police enforcement uh, traffic uh, control where we can write tickets and uh, as the county does, Atherton and Miller Park, they all have police agencies, and that was not mentioned in the, in the minutes here. So I want that put in there to show that we have the problem, and we can't control the problem because we don't have our own police agencies. <laughs> Is that the only that change? Was, that was the fine. only change. That was the only change I wanted to answer. Okay, and I just wanted to note that I had made some changes to the minutes and they have been incorporated in the revised minutes. Yeah, uh, sure. read, yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes as submitted. By the item, item number five. And second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 So item five is approved with the modification as noted. And I'm sorry, I missed who seconded that. Um, um, Rob seconded. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're now under number 13, which is the one I just brought up. Um, this is the standing um, committee member. There's, there's a report in here from, um, from our attorney. Um, and um, so basically, what I, what I think the attorney has said here is that we cannot I had wanted to be able. I had wanted to add any mem any board member to a committee, so that the committee had a quorum and could meet. Uh, according to the opinion of the attorney here, we have to specify who the alternative, who the alternate is. It, it, do I understand correctly what you said? Um, there, were, there are two things in response to the change that we're not talking about what's in the staff report but an alternate um, proposal to have the board president. So just so I'm understanding the proposal, the board president would have the discretion to appoint any board member as a alternate on an as-needed basis. That's what I originally proposed in the January meeting. Okay. And I said any board member could be the alternate. And you seem to be saying here that that's not permitted under the Brown Act or something. I okay, and maybe, all right. Well, just to address that proposal, the two comments we had was one, that the board policy manual says that um, the president may change committee position but it's with the approval of the board. the board. And we were just making the comment, it's your rule, but you should so sort of specify it's either exception to the rule or or change the rule that's in your policy, but that's your rule. And our second comment was that on the Brown Act that it wasn't 
you know, what I said was that it is consistent with the letter of the law, but if you look at how standing committees are treated under the Brown Act, they're treated as legislative bodies and they're subject to the meeting and the agenda requirements. And although it doesn't say you can have a you know rotating standing committee if you so choose, I was saying that I think there are some concerns in the standing committee setting of having this potential of every board member at one time or another being a member of that standing committee. That it just sort of complicates the issue we identified in the staff report of Brown Act compliance. Not that it's prohibited, but that it creates sort of a greater potential for keeping compliance with the Brown Act by having potentially rotating standing committee members. So that, that was our response to that proposal. Yeah, um, as, as you know, the Brown Act is one of the things that I have great affection for and a lot of experience on. My reading of the Brown Act and the Attorney General's opinion is that it would be perfectly appropriate um, if one member of a standing committee was not able to attend a meeting uh, for the president to designate another board member to, to attend that meeting. The Brown Act comes into effect, though, that on those items on the agenda at that committee meeting that the two board members have discussed, they are prohibited until that matter is taken up in open session by the entire board from discussing those issues with other members of the board. So if, for example, I'm filling in for somebody else on a committee that I don't stand, normally sit on, I would see that as perfectly appropriate. But between the time of that committee meeting and the board meeting, I should not then discuss those items with the person who I was replacing. And that discussion should take place in the open session. Right. Is that's, that? That's how I interpret that, it, too. That's, yeah, and if you read the policy that was in the staff report, it essentially says that. The question was whether you have a single member designated as an alternate or whether, as you just addressed, it is done on an as-needed basis at the discretion right. of the president. And, and like I was saying, and, I, and just to repeat what I was saying, said the letter of the Brown Act does not prohibit that, but it complicates what you were saying. But if you follow the rule, you follow the rule. And, and that's what it is. I would like so. to make a motion that the president has the authority to designate a substitute when a primary member of a subcommittee is not available. So on an ad needed, yeah, as needed basis, basically. <coughs> right? That's what you said. Yeah, I just want to clarify because things can get muddy. And who seconded it? I did. Okay. Um, and uh, is there any discussion? Just All in favor? Can, can I have just one thing? And that I think the recommendation about the policy that Peter articulated that's in the staff report right. about the alternate, the restrictions on their discussions with others will be part. Yeah, is that all right with you to put in the caveat about the restrictions? No, because, you know, that's the law. You know, yeah, we can't change the law. We can't okay. change the, I you agree. Know, we can alert people to it, et cetera, but mm -hmm. our motion is simply to authorize you to do something. We don't need to then say, and oh, by the way, obey the law. Can you, can you please read the motion back, Michelle? I didn't write it down. I was going to get it from the video. Okay. The motion that the president can appoint an alternate member to a committee. When the primary member is not available. When a primary member is not mm -hmm. available. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. No further discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Do have we then? What what do we have to do anything further with item thirteen, or have we done done the action? I think that's sufficient. Let's move yeah, on to item fourteen. Okay, item fourteen um, is 
the, accept the recommend finance committee return, re, regarding the uh, matrix report. Um, Rob, I think you pulled that off. Is that correct? Yeah, I did. Would you like to speak to it first, please? Uh, yeah, I, I just thought, thought that even though the finance committee made a recommendation, which I may or may not uh, agree with, I think we should have a more discussion about it. Okay. I agree with that. It shouldn't have been no, I mean, yeah, opinion. I may okay. agree with the recommendation, uh, but I think we should have a little more discussion agree. about it. And that, actually, I'm going to just piggyback on that. That's why I had a problem with everything being on consent. Well, I'm not going to agree with that. I, I'm, just, I'm just taking, uh, I think it's, it's a good, well, that's getting out of the realm. I think yeah. we're just, yeah, let's just talk about 14. That's what, what I'm concerned about is that I can agree with the recommendation of the Finance Committee, but I think this is a very important discussion item yeah. that all of us should have input in. Well, let me, let me say as, as a member of the committee, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. Um, we, we basically said it was premature to do anything at this time. We should wait and see what unfolds. Um, we should, at some future time, talk about the possibility of having a consultant if that were needed. And we decided to move on. And somehow to put on an agenda the item of doing nothing seemed sort of silly. So, but maybe it wasn't silly to have the discussion. I mean, I, right. I, 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 I agree with you, but in any case, um, we, we just didn't want to do anything at that time. So that was the recommendation of the Finance Committee. Yeah. Chuck, if I go may, ahead, here. as the other member of the Finance Committee, uh, I think all of you know that I have some strong feelings about this, but the fact is, as Director Bernstein has indicated, um, we do not have an action before us. Uh, we were not given the opportunity to review the report for accuracy before it was published. We've not been asked to comment on it since. The town is having a meeting tomorrow night to discuss it, and the fire district has not been invited to participate or be present. So we basically have nothing before us. And so I will now make a motion that we simply table this item. I'll second the motion. And one of the reasons I think we felt obliged to put this on the agenda at all was because at the last meeting, we agreed as a board that we would discuss it at this meeting. And so I didn't feel that I had the authority as, as the president to just dismiss it when, in fact, the whole board had voted to put it on the agenda. So Peter's motion is basically saying, let's table it for now. Any discussion on that motion? Well, oh, Rob, if I may. Um, it's okay to table, and I agree with the motion. Uh, but um, at what point? Is it going to be at the March meeting that we're going to have a discussion on, on this particular um, document or a metric study, or is it just going to be wait and it, see? It may be moot. But, um, it, 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 could you elaborate on that? Well, you know, the town is going to get input from citizens and decide what it wants to do. <coughs> it decides it doesn't want to do anything, then, you know, we move on. Let me add to Peter's comment. I, I did attend the meeting when it was first presented, um, and the, the, the town plans to have another public airing of it this week and then bring it back to their agenda in March to see what, if any, action they want to take place. So I doubt it would be on our March agenda because, again, I don't think we know what's happening and where things are going. And the purpose of having to try to talk about it tonight was... It was yeah, right. like why why was it even on here? I mean, I mean I, why was it just, even on the finance committee? I just want to understand that? just understand if, if if we were to talk about it and there what might have been some outcome as a result, is this the information that would be given to, right. to the That's town the or or is this for our mm -hmm. own enlightenment and discussion? Yeah. You know, what what right. are we gonna do with the information? Right. If we did discuss it, and, and how long did it take for well, staff? Well, you know, we, we can ask these these kind of 
rhetorical questions. All five members of the board voted to bring it up, so I don't know what you were going to say, or Rob or Virginia. The fact is, the two of us uh, felt at this point we didn't have anything to say about it, and our recommendation was that we table it. If you think we should discuss it, yeah, I'm, just trying, I'm, just, yeah. I'm just trying to figure out the process so that in the future, when issues come up, such as this one, as hot as it seem to be, that there is a process for the board to filter through information so that if there's anything of value that should come out of the goat wherever it needs to go, that we have adequate time to do it. That, that's the only thing. When it was discussed before, just to be clear though, it was on the part of the agenda where we're talking about whether we want to have a conversation. It was not on the agenda to be discussed substantively. Sure. It wasn't on the future agenda. It was on the future, future agenda, agenda to see if we should put it on there. So at that point, we never determined what the process was or what we were going to talk about. We hadn't gone that far. Yes, go ahead, Rob. Yeah. I also sat through the presentation at the Atherton uh, town meeting. And you know, I saw some inaccuracies in the presentation, some of the expenses that were put forward and some of the things that I consider uh, us as a district compared to uh, having an independent fire agency uh, with some of the assets being split, uh, what's their pension liability going to be if they do split, just a whole multitude of questions that were not even covered by the metric study when he did the presentation. I had gone to the website and had went through the actual study and then I sat through the presentation and I still have considerable amount of questions and <coughs> I go along with the table and to find out that exactly I pretty much know what the metric study is and the inaccuracies in the metric study and I, I think it's it's a good point Peter to, to table it until we find out what the, what the citizens want. I think but, it's fatally flawed but I think that those fatal flaws will in fact be a subject to discussion by the town council. Um, I just want to we've know. Not, we've been not, not asked to opine on it. Right. And so uh, I just want to know what the town actually wants from us as a fire district. And I've been asking that, I think, what, four or three, four meetings. Yeah. Well, if you go back. What does the town of Atherton want? Yeah, if you go back to the original staff report, it was very clear. You know, that they either wanted to have a revenue sharing agreement or they wanted to have detachment. And in spite of everything that they've said since then. But they, but then they I'm make gonna, a presentation saying, yeah, but then they make a presentation saying that they don't want to withdraw from the fire the, district. The, so, uh, the purpose of this know. motion, the, we're discussing <laughs> the motion to table right now. So I'm right. Gonna, um, yeah, but these are discussion items that, actually, that I think to be perfectly clear, a motion to table is not debatable. Right. So, so okay. there's a motion and a second. So, I'm going right. to call Thank for the vote. Okay. <laughs> you don't need to call for it. Right? <laughs> that, that's <laughs> my error. All right. I'll second. I, have, I apologize. We've already got a second. All right, let's vote. Let's vote. <laughs> so I, I, I apologize <laughs> for uh, <laughs> I, I, I being that, generous. I knew that. I should have. OK, all in favor of tabling the motion? Aye. Aye. Opposed? OK, 5-0. Director, can I answer one question? Director Crawley brought it up. So why did it go to finance? Because it's a fiscal review, so that's why it ended up there. I know why it went to finance, but if we're not going to do anything anyway, I, I, I got my answer, my answer, I got it from various, but I understand why it went to the finance committee. That's not the issue. And then for finance, it's okay the two directors want to table it, but that's not a quorum, so it had to come back to the full body for you to make that decision collectively. Okay, thank you. Well, I just want to say I agree. I agree if Rob is the one who wanted to take it off and, and have the discussion. Okay, item 15 is the recommendation um, or the, the finance committee recommendation relating to the house lots 28 and 32 Almondral, Almondral Avenue. Um, this, this again was one of those funny things where there was no proposal on the table and we recommend doing nothing further for the time being. Um, so I'm not even sure that a motion is needed on this. It was kind of a non-action, but it's here for discussion. 
Well, so it's, let me, it's let, let me ask. It accepts that we're at being asked to accept yeah. the recommendations. So I, just, I just wanted to pull because I just had one question. Go ahead. How, how, how is the town of, uh, of Atherton going to zone those, those parcels? Are they going to zone them as a public uh, facility? Or are they gonna, how are they well, going to uh, Rob, I think it's been zoned. They, they, are, they have a zoning. Yeah, and it would be up to us to take the action to zone them differently if we wanted to. And we felt that we should not do that at this time. Yeah, we purchased the property in the, in, as is, and it comes with its established zoning. Uh, and we were looking at it from a financial perspective and what's in the best interest of the district. And we felt that this time uh, it's best to preserve that asset um, as an independent asset. Uh, we know from the discussions we had at the time of the property acquisition that we didn't anticipate doing something with that station for a number of years. Uh, what the dilemma that we've continued to discuss in the Finance Committee is how do we most benefit as an agency financially from the purchase that we've made. And so the first decision that we've made is that we should not merge the parcels at this time. We should maintain them as two separate entities. The second recommendation, which is included on page one, uh, is that we explore the construction of an auxiliary, a secondary occupancy unit, which is authorized under both state law and the town of Atherton zoning, so that we maximize the value of the asset that we hold. Um, and that would then come back to, um, to the board at a later time with a recommendation from the chief as to whether or not construction of such a secondary unit uh, was deemed to be advantageous, and then it would be the board's decision as to whether or not that was an expense we wish to incur. But we couldn't do that if we merged the parcels, because the minute we merge the parcels, then we move away from the favorable zoning yeah. that we have for the residential property. That's for sure. Okay. Thank you. So I would make the motion that we accept the recommendations, uh, including authorizing the chief to explore the construction of a 1,200 square foot secondary structure. Second. Robert, I said, did you second? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Robert, second. Okay, uh, is there further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Okay, that's item 15. Um, 16. 16. 16 is the next one on the list. And Rob, I think, did, was that yours? Yeah. Great. Yo, I, I was, um, since there are still so many false alarms, Chief, could there be some type of a penalty you can impose on them because of all the false alarms? Yeah, so I, I mean, they say that, you know, it's, it's going down, but they're still pretty high. So what I would tell you is we went off of a base number of calls with SLAP for how we charge them, and we've never exceeded that number. In fact, we're below it. So at the end of the day, I mean, if you want to look at it through SLAP. Even with the false alarms? Yeah, it's under 100 calls per year in total. So they've never exceeded that. In fact, they're well down below it. What's going on right now with the false alarms is the LINAC has been opened up because it extracted the old laser system and they're, they're basically putting a new system in. So there's some contractor issues with alarms. But overall, I gotta tell you, I mean, if, I, if I'm them, I'm actually looking at it from a different way, which is, you know, we're not, we're not meeting the 100 calls per year. In, in other words, they're paying for more capacity than they're, they're getting. But they're not squabbling about that, I'm arguing another one. So. Yeah, but they're still false alarms. Yeah. I mean... But that was all factored you know, in to the 100, up to 100 calls per year. Yeah, but for our firefighters to respond to false alarms, they're taking just as much of a threat if it's a real alarm. So that they're still putting our people in jeopardy, even though they're, they're under the 100 alarms. Uh, I mean... They, I understand your reasoning, but... <laughs> But, you know, there could be a time where it could be a false alarm and, and they may need an engine in another place. 
That's true. And most of these calls, when they come in, Slack has their own security force that's investigating that. And a lot of times, we're getting canceled and rude. So you can look at it from that standpoint, too. But I mean, if the board doesn't want to go with an extension, then we open up the contract. And I don't know what that means, because then they're going to want to renegotiate. That could be we get paid less. It could be we ask for more. I mean, personally, I don't look at it as a, a negative. They're happy. We're happy, as far as I'm concerned. And you know, they're handling what they need to handle on campus. It's a renovating the campus. So a lot of the false alarms will be gone because of all the rebuilding of the money that's being sunk into the campus and has been modernized. I'd like to make a motion to review and accept the report and to approve the resolution. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Further discussion? Chief, I wondered if you would mind uh, reiterating some stuff you told me about the radiation safety procedures that we have with this and what we've done with our firefighters. Yeah, so there's a whole exclusionary area that they run a secondary containment on. So when you go to the Slack campus, you can drive pretty much up the security gate and you can get on. And that's one ring. And then there's a secondary ring that takes you out to the one actor where a lot of the experimentation gets done. There's secondary security in there. They'll have rad badging and so forth there. So they're looking at dosimeters. They're looking at if there's any leakage or slip on anybody that's come on campus, any vendor, any employee, including the fire district. You know, we go through that annually with them. On the hazmat side, I would say, you know, they're probably the best organization I've ever seen when it comes to how they track, how clean the facility is. And we're talking about very low level amounts. Really the biggest thing was the old LINAC line, which they're replacing, was the laser beam, which we shouldn't be down there anyway when it's energized. And so they would need to shut that down if we needed to go subsurface for a fire. Um, that's really the only issues that are in there. And you know, they're super controlled and super careful. And uh, again, it's, it's not, because there's federal standards on everything, their way of, of handling that has to comply with all the standards. And not only are they well in compliance, but again, equally, it's not like, a, it's not like a Lawrence Livermore lab situation. That's not what they do there. And it's also not, not like other entities in the district that we have that I'd be more concerned about that are more um, private facilities that do actually a poor job of tracking and a poor job of how they handle things. Do we have any radiation type protective gear that we use? No. I mean, so be your, be your, if you had to do anything, it'd be your level A, or excuse me, your level C, which is the turnouts and the SCBA. But they're not going to even let it go there. I mean, you know, we're not going to go subsurface until the Linux gets shut down. They have so many controls on that. You know, it's almost impossible for a human being to be down there because of the way that they sweep and they check and they exclude and they shut down and they track everything and everybody so that that doesn't happen. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? So the motion is to approve the uh, two-year extension. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. One no. And I'd like to give an explanation why. Uh, the large amount of false alarms, they still really haven't, uh, with the radio communications there, there's still dead spots in that area. And I don't think they've worked on any of that. And the last time uh, Stanford put out a, re uh, a request for uh, a fire agency to take, to take over Stanford, they didn't get any other than what they had. So I think we're in a good negotiating position to renegotiate that contract. That's why I voted no. Thank you. Okay, number 18 um, here is the resolution regarding the mid year budget adjustment, specifically um, the addition, the increase of uh, firefighter staffing from 94 to 97. Virginia, I think you brought this up. Yeah, and we both pulled it out. I don't know if you want to start. But. Well, let, let me ahead. say, I didn't want to address the specifics of it, but I, I think I've been trying, well, I, I'm, I'm taking issue with the report that's attached to this, not 
the, the specific item. The, re the report, is, the staff report is outdated. It's got old information in it. It's got things that we're not doing. It's got some things that we're doing differently. And I'd like to make sure that when we study this item right now, we focus only on the issue of the three firefighters, that nothing else in this report so is... So the, re the resolution actually does that? Right. The only, the only reason I kept those other items because those were suggested for study sessions. So I'm sorry it's not broken out. But the reso, as put in here, is for the three positions. And it doesn't convolute or, you know deteriorate those that are so they're separate. Yeah, I just felt, I, I want to be clear though, I, in the minutes actually, that some of these, some of these items in here are not, are not accurate anymore. They've changed over right. time. They're changing sometimes weekly. But for, for the sake of the press, for example, somebody might take the staff report and say that what we're doing is approving all these other items. All we're focusing on is the issue of the three staff. And the resolution, I think, clearly spells it out. Okay. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the resolution, attachment A. So moved. No, there's a second. Are you going to second it? Mm -hmm. Second. Okay. Rob Solano seconded. Um, so Virgin I had a question. Virginia, go ahead. So, so Harold, I know that this was kind of tied to, it wasn't kind of, it was tied to the truck that was supposed to be traded. We were supposed to trade for, what is the status of that? So right now the Quint was in service until earlier today. It's still got a light problem, so it's gone back out of service. We've been talking manufacturer. I mean, that's, again, it depends on what we're going to do going forward. And I committed to Director Bernstein and the Finance Committee that we'll let them know because in December you approved a truck. Right, but truck it was contingent on being able to trade right. it. Right, so we're not, we're not buying another truck right now that would have to come before you and so forth. We're try, still trying to work out some of these issues, but if you look at the staff report, what I tried to explain too in there, remember last year we, re, we reached our staffing goal for one day and somebody yeah. put a notice for retirement. So we're, we're equally here again this year. We just had a, we just had a Captain Slate retired. And we promoted the tiny sheet on the sheet bar at the end of the two people down. So this actually gives us a little bit of a buffer on staffing so that we're not constantly being whittled down, which is what has been happening to us as we set the target. You know what I mean? So we're trying to hit the target, but the target's always elusive because things happen that we can't predict. The retirement can't be predicted. Uh, a promotion can't be predicted with a vacancy even in staff. And if we lose a probationary firefighter because they don't pass, or they, somebody leaves the organization, then immediately you're not going to reach your staffing goal. Well, so do we need these extra three right away? Yeah, because we're already down. And so and since I talked to you guys in December, we're down one will be down two. <coughs> okay, but I, yeah, I saw that, but okay. So you're going to run into deficit if you want to line. So, you know, I, I guess it's the way to probably can't... put it is, is to shoot ahead of what the target is, only because through, again, different factors that hit us on attrition, those aren't very, well, they're predictable, but they're not necessarily preventable. Chief, I think, I think the explanation isn't quite making sense. I'm not disagreeing with it, but if we're already down, then we could still come up to our staffing level and be okay. I mean, I... I this seems like no, it's no, an in addition to... So it's a sequence. Yeah, I think you, you need to elaborate. You can only people into the this... academy at certain points. So we run that on a deficit, because you guys are concerned, as you should be, and we are too, on the overtime model, right? So that it's always a balancing act, because in the past, we now we're going to do a, a spring academy this year, which is the first time. We typically only do a fall one. Yeah, that's in September. You right, know. because again, we just hired in the fall of last year, and now we're hiring in the spring. Is that, and when is that? It's coming up in March. March, right? right around the corner. Yeah. So this was one of those reasons to jump on this now, or we're going to miss that window. Um, so, so you know, let me be clear here. I, I want to reiterate what I said at the, at the Finance Committee. I, I'm voting for this, but I, I want to be clear. First of all, when we we're increasing three. What we're really talking about is one person per shift. So it only adds one person at a time. At, at it's any not time. Versus. The second thing, I voted against it at the last meeting, that is the purchase of a new truck. I, 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 I'm not convinced. I know it's a lot of frustration with the Quint, but the Quint, I think, was a very good idea. We ended up getting a piece of equipment that doesn't work 
as advertised. No problems. But, but the, the quint, and so I don't want to be giving up necessarily on the quint as a piece of equipment. Um, what we discussed is somehow trying to find a way, at the Finance Committee, we discussed somehow trying to find a way where we could authorize a higher level such that the chief could hire to that level, and by the time the people were interviewed, hired, trained, we would sort of go back down so that, in a sense, they'd be unassigned initially. Am I saying it right, Peter? Um, yeah, basically what we have to do is to give the chief some headroom, because otherwise what happens is he, he goes up to the limit of 94, and then we very quickly drop down. We need a little bit more headroom. That's all. Um, it's, and it's covered within opposed, the budget. Yeah, I just wanted an explanation from Harold. But so I'm not opposed to it. So it's not, it's not necessarily one, if I may. Um, may not necessarily hire them, those individuals? Right? No, we'd hire them, yeah, but by the time they me. were come in, they may, the level may have dropped down to, That's to a critical a, level a where we level. need to. Yeah. So we set the goal, and again, I think last year was a great example. The day we hit 93 fire for 94 last year, the next day somebody put in the retirement lab. Yeah. See, so in order, order, that's the problem, right? right? Yeah. In order to maintain the 94, the chief has to have the ability to occasionally go over that to have 95 or 96 or 97 because then when he loses people, you know, we're not down. Right. I get that. I was tying it to the truck. Because the, the training cycle is so long. That's, that, that that, that's what's thing. different I than most that. other positions is that when you get a vacancy, you can't just bring somebody in tomorrow and put them in that vacancy. You've got this long lead time. No, I, we get For about that. five, six months. Okay. But and there is one more issue, though. I mean, the, the, the point is, when we approved the last contract with the IAFF, we agreed to increase the staffing on the ladder truck from three firefighters to four. Right. I, again, I voted, I voted against buying that truck at this point, but the minute we're buying a truck, we have, we have to, to increase it. one person to so do that. Even, even the Quint has four personnel on it. Is so, that required under the contract? Right, because it's an aerial ladder. Okay. So we've been running that, obviously, you know, with staffing a certain way as well. Now, the good news is on a quint, you don't have an engine and a truck. So technically, in that model, you would end up with four standalone different than you have now, right? That's 12 people. And then we put two on the rescue, right? So we have six. The six. So there's a way we'd have to, if we ever change that, we'd always have the fourth on the truck, two on the rescue, then you would need just one more to have a separate standalone, but you would sacrifice the rescue company to do mm -hmm. that. So those are all the things that you know Chief Long and I are looking at and we're as we come back to you, we're gonna have to present, you know, going forward, we promise we would do that, looking at, you know, what was the five where where and what were the five hundred calls that we increased this last year because we increased by five hundred calls. We're at nine thousand plus incidents per year right now. That's what we're going to do at the March meeting, isn't it? We're going to have the yeah. deployment yeah. session and talk about yeah. the data, the information, you know, so you have a better understanding not only not only where are the calls, but how many and what's, you know, what's going up and where. You know, how many medicals, how many fires, you know, what's the issue, as we've talked about, with the size of effective force. And, you know, and, and again, I, I will say this, in the past, when we were in the recessionary times, you know, we ran a lot leaner than we're running right now because, you know, we worked this place over on overtime because we were worried about the pension issues. So we flexed, but that puts a tremendous strain on your system, especially when you have a national response team, you have all these wildland fires, and those things all happen simultaneously. You gotta fill seats here, because you gotta have that force no matter what, because that's what the community's paying for, but we've got two engines out on the strike teams. We've got a USAR team that gets called up for a water rescue in Texas or Florida or whatever. So, you know, being fully staffed allows us to do all those things and, and it's a much easier process to do it. When we're running around 70, which is where we've been before, you know, figure out what you can't do. But what you can't ever do is not staff the fire trucks because that's so why we're here. I thought I understood, but, but perhaps I, I didn't um, after all. With, with the staffing at 94, were we staffed for a fourth person on the quint? We have a fourth person on the quint currently, yes. Under the 94? Yes. Yeah. 
You thought I it see. was three, right? Yes, I thought one of the rationales was because we had gone to the... <coughs> well, when I say that, just know that's not, we've never factored that into the staffing. That's Factor been done essentially on, mostly on an overtime basis. So by factoring in, you get the bodies now that we would have had before, or should have had before. So 94 doesn't include a fourth person on the court. No, it does. Does. Then what do you're saying it's, all, it's done by overtime. When we put the Quint in service, our staffing model, which hasn't changed, was at the 94. The Quint took one more person and put it on that truck. Now how can you do that? Because on your daily minimum staffing, if you don't meet the minimum staffing with the number of personnel that you have, you use overtime. So, so we do it. back when we got the Quint, we should have gone to 97. Correct. Okay, that's what I was but trying remember to remember that the whole purpose behind the quint was, because I think everybody's forgetting this, that was experimental. We're trying right. to see how we can work this system without not <coughs> having to buy a completely sec secondary Se truck, right? right? And we right. know where the problem is. We know it's a challenge. We know that's what the city gate report recommended five years ago because of the congestion, because of the building, because of everything. So it's been that kind of creative way to get there. And you also put in place, remember, put that rescue in place every day, too. That's two people. So in some ways, you know, we're, we've been messing around with staffing to see what's going to work and what's working better. You know, I wish I could report you to Quint, but this <coughs> was working well for us. That's, that's the Achilles heel, is that combination vehicle is not performed. The right, way that's. Okay, so, so when is that going to go back in service? Well, it's, <laughs> it, was, it was in service till today. No, I know. So when is <coughs> it? Uh, it's, it's, uh, right now, it's, it's uh, an ongoing argument between Pierce and Detroit. Detroit is the voter manufacturer. Uh, Pierce is saying it's a Detroit issue. Uh, they did much work on it when it was out of service two weeks ago. <coughs> uh, Detroit sent technicians up here and it took about three days to get back in service. Uh, we ran it for a couple of days and the same issue is occurring. The check engine line comes on, which means better stop before you destroy something. <coughs> and then we call all these people again and say, you did it again. Yeah. And we just keep repeating. <coughs> Unfortunately, there's no lemon laws for commercial vehicles. I was just going to ask yeah, you. I mean, it's it, crazy that, it's, how, yeah. that we spend well, so much money on something that is not building, working yeah, we're in, in a busy yeah. time. And unfortunately, you know, Pierce makes a great product. It's probably like any other GM, Ford, whatever out there. Occasionally, it goes off the line. We did not get lucky with this one. You know, so we're kind of lucky. But they love that old truck, let me tell you. The one we paid uh, $15,000 for. Uh, our, our, our <laughs> well, I mean, we may have bought like the wrong thing. Down the street, I don't know, maybe you're going to do what you used to. They really didn't say something. That's a bad one. Too much of Peter's. No, because right. it sounds fine. Okay. I don't think so we need to. Let me be clear. Your commitment is that we won't buy the ladder truck That's until right. the credit is assured on the Quinn. And that was in that request contingent. No, it was right. contingent. That's I just want to be sure that. Yeah. Right. Right. That so until I can get a credit, I can't go and purchase another piece of right. equipment anyway because you'd have to approve it. And I'm pretty sure at this point, you're not going to write me a check for 1.3 million because no. that's different. That's that it. looks a whole lot different. Yeah. That was not what. The original intent was for yeah. So we're, you know, yeah, we're trying to solve these problems as they come. I mean, it's dynamic. I don't want to tell you it's not. I don't think it's it is. And so you know, the good news is on staffing. If we do this, we're we're ahead of it, right. which is in a nice nice in a, we're in a nice position to be there. Thank okay. You. Any further discussion on item 18? Rob, please. No, no, no. no. Oh. No, he seconded the motion. <laughs> he, was, he was raising no, his hand. No, 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 no. no further? Okay, I call all, all, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Okay, that completes the consent agenda items. Pretty much the whole, uh, the whole meeting. Um, coming down to the, the president's report, um, I will. I'm reporting as Chuck Bernstein and not as president here because it's not related exactly to the president, but a couple of things. One is that um, I did attend the meeting of the oversight committee that was held last week uh, regarding the um, sort of the successor, pardon me, the successor agencies and what happens with the, uh, the uh, RDA monies. And um, I was actually elected to be the representative 
um, for all special districts in San Mateo County. So that. Because fifty percent of the money is ours. <laughs> well, in, in fact, yeah, we have the lion's share of the money. Of the money, RDA 50, money. Almost fifty percent of it, yeah. and um, um, I, uh, uh, Robert could report on this too, but I continue to attend, and I'm, I'm very proud of the East Palo Alto organization that is uh, that uh, met. Uh, two weeks ago or a week ago to uh, continue the work there. That, that's progressing nicely. Um, I'm signed up and I hope others will sign up to attend this search training on March 10th. Um, it's taking place in East Palo Alto also. Uh, this time um, we've got the cooperation of the whole city it appears. We did not have the police department or the city council before we do this time. So. We're making progress in that way. And we've also, on the training things, I'm one of the teachers. I'm teaching the uh, Get Ready classes in English. Uh, there are two people, Luis Guzman and Romain Tanier, who are teaching it in Spanish. And we're alternating. Uh, we've had the gift of the community room in East Palo Alto to do this. First time I was ever at the facility, and I I never got a chance to tell you, Chief. I called you panicked at the last minute because when I got there, the door wasn't open. But the door that wasn't open was the main door. I had no idea that there was an industrial separate. door right. separate. But this is, you know, it's a panic. People are coming and for the training and we couldn't get in. Now you're but we, sign, right? we could get in, and it, it turns out to be a very nice room. Um, and um, so I think we're ready to be very active in the training. I, I, what we found in doing the get ready trainings, which are short, they're two hour trainings, that almost half the people that attended those trainings were interested in taking the CERT training as a follow up. So it's a very powerful recruiter for CERT. Um, and lastly, and I hope to put this on the agenda, um, well actually, uh, I'll, I'll wait till we come to the proposed agenda items to talk about that. So that's my report. And I'll start down there with you, Robert, uh, yeah. if you'd like to make a uh, Report as a director. Well, I uh, attended a, last week a a community meeting um, that was um, in part I wouldn't say by the board, the JPA board uh, for the San Francisco, San Francisco Creek. Uh, there was the meeting was called by a group of uh, residents who was concerned about the the bike lane along the levees being closed and um, <clears throat> they couldn't understand why it was closed when there was no construction going on. And so there was, uh, I can't think of the gentleman's name, who was the executive director of the JPA. He was there along Glenn with... Glenn Glenn? Yeah. Mattermann. Right. <clears throat> and then there was another gentleman uh, who was the, I guess, the project manager. So they was there to try to explain why they why there was no construction going on and why the bank, bike lane was closed. <clears throat> so an upshot of that is that they will look into it and discuss it at the next meeting, JPA meeting, which is I think tomorrow or Thursday. And that will be my first meeting of the actual board itself that I will be attending. Um, so that's pretty much the meeting I went to, what they talked about. They wasn't angry, they were just wanted to know why it was closed when there was no construction going on. And, uh, I have to say something here, which is, this is an error on my part. I should have put on the agenda that a change in committees, and I, I failed to do so. Um, Virginia was on the Creek JPA. She no, could not. The no, EMS. Oh, the EMS. Yes, but she could not do it because of a conflict. Or she has meetings that are on the same night as their meetings, and I appointed Robert to attend in her place, in, um, and that's. Uh, but I did not put that on the agenda. Tim, I, I assume this this change in assignments needs to be on the agenda. Is that correct? Is it? Was it just for one? No, it's permanent. Can you just come back to you? Oh, okay. Um, would you uh, 
Michelle, put the, the, that change in committee assignment as an agenda item for yeah, March? I will. Okay, that, that was my oversight. And uh, I did it for one meeting because it was a last minute emergency. And, uh, but uh, now this will be a regular thing. Okay. Is that all for you, Robert? Yes. yes okay, you. Rob? Yeah, uh, thanks, Chuck. I attended the uh, San Mateo County uh, CORA, which is uh, the organization, the community organization against domestic violence fundraiser on January 27th. I attended the, uh, in San Francisco, the National Police Memorial Museum Foundation fundraiser on January 18th. And I attended the Silicon Valley Homeland Security Group in Palo Alto on February 15th. That's all I have to report. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. Virginia. Um, yes, I just have something very short, and it's regarding the Santa Cruz Alameda Y task force <coughs> meeting. There was one, um, I can't even remember when, because we, I think earlier, this, there was actually the latter part of January, and there was queuing, the, the issue about queuing and the lines, and you know, how long, um, how much of a traffic jam thing, you know, the traffic's going to cause. And I think that. Um, John and the CHP and the sheriff's office, we were all there. John Johnston, our fire marshal, we're going to look at getting queuing data that they have all collected. So I don't know if that's even happened because our next meeting is uh, next Tuesday, the 27th. And so I'm hoping that we'll have something. That yeah, John would have it. That's well, he was saying that he <coughs> must. I don't Probably know. If, it's either law enforcement has it or the county itself would have it. Well, the county presented some right. of that data. Because they'll do that. But, it's but whoever lays out the rubber strips and counts the cars. They'll right. say, you know, the queue's going to be and how, how many cars are going to be queued now to one lane. So you okay. can predict the backup. Well, for some on. reason, I was under the impression John said he had something and he was going to. Okay. We don't have rubber. Well, we we need to get something going because right now I think that the. Cyclists think that, um, and these are not the you know safe routes to school cyclists. These are the the cyclists that you know want to do the road diets. They think that that task force has been put together to advocate for them, which is not the case. It, it what is what is the case is that the residents want to have um, Alameda, you know, in you know, that area near the Y, all the way down to Sharon Road near Lawn Trotta Middle School you know, kind of safe for everybody. And I think the residents want our um, emergency responders and law enforcement officers to be able to have access to. So whatever John has, has discussed with C the CHP and the sheriff's office, primarily I think the sheriff's office, he needs to maybe push them a little to get this data and, or something. Because we, we can't, we need to continue to have this strong voice or we're going to have some unintended consequences. I know the un, the unofficial discussion that I was involved with with John was that, and again, you know, there's many partners, but on the public safety side, there, we don't know why we would change this because it's it may not be for everybody, and that's the problem. Is if everybody thinks they get a win out of right. it, there is no such right. thing. And the one. county has said that too. Right. And so you know, do, leaving it the way it, the way it is may be the best way to deal with it. You know, I haven't, again, I've heard a little bit about the queuing. Queuing is going to be terrible. Yeah. You know, I don't understand it. I mean, you go from two, or from two lanes or four lanes to two or to one, it's, I don't know what everybody's thinking. The cars are going to go somewhere. They're going to queue up. Well, so, so the same thing on Middlefield and Appleton. We met with Appleton. We talked about what they're doing in North Fair Oaks. It's the same thing. I mean, so then they track from there, how many minutes are you going to be now back into the next jurisdiction? And then you're going to look for the cut through, right? So now yep. you're going to go and look at all the routes that people are going to start going through somebody's neighborhood, and then we're going to get the next round of here comes all the traffic control devices. So I did talk to some um, people in Los Lomitas School District who are in charge of facilities and the construction of the camp, I think Los Lomitas campus, and dealing with that Walsh Road Alameda intersection. Yeah. And uh, they, I well, they told me that they would support what we're trying to do because they're concerned about their bus routes 
um, having problems with all of these road dikes because they've got the wide turning radius too and as it is they're having to, to use alternate routes instead of like going down 80 for example to Alameda they have to go to Sharon all the way so their bus routes they're afraid that or concerned that their bus routes might be affected so it's kind of good that we've got the law enforcement the school community the residents and us kind of on the same page so I just want to keep that momentum going I agree, I mean, but not everybody's going to be happy, so. And I think Atherton, um, well, so what happened at the last meeting was they, the cyclists had brought in someone, and we weren't, we weren't really going to bring in outside people until we were ready, and um, they did, and so I think Atherton is interested in, you know, kind of being a participant because they're obviously well, concerned, beer. right? And, you know, and the county is actually, quite frankly, concerned about the Alameda, <coughs> Atherton Avenue intersection, too. You know, what are they going to do? So there are going to be other stakeholders involved. But I wanted to put it out there tonight that this is an ongoing discussion and that at least I'm trying to be on top of it and uh, build um, some kind of group that, would, that understands our situation. And I think that we've got that. And the county is kind of supportive, it seems, but we'll see. Well, they're not going to take out a lane near Sand Hill and Santa this, Cruz. This is the same county that's going to narrow middle that to do I know. Well, I, yeah. <laughs> anyway, we got there before, and I'm glad the residents brought us in. Okay. Do other reports? Or? Nope, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. No, I think uh, Finance Committee, uh, we did a lot of our homework on getting stuff ready for this agenda. Nothing else to report that wasn't uh, transmitted to the board. I have nothing else. Okay. I'll move to item 23, proposed agenda items. Peter, you have number 23 and number 24 here. I have a couple also to add after that. Um, but go ahead on the district-wide alert system. Well, this is one of the things that we've been discussing for a period of time, and we also discussed it at some, in some detail at the joint meeting with Atherton uh, a number of years ago. We were involved and, and, and played a very strong role in getting the Walsh Road siren installation put in place. As we look at the Napa fires, one of the big takeaways there is that the alert systems which require telephones and internets and cell phones and stuff like that simply don't reach people. <clears throat> Director Solano was there that night in, in a hotel. He can give you firsthand what happened. Um, and we've been to enough disasters around the country to know that <clears throat> you can't rely on those kinds of systems to let people know that there's a problem and they need to do something. And so I would like us uh, at our next meeting uh, to begin a discussion with the staff about how we can begin to roll out a district-wide emergency alert system. We're going to have to partner with the cities and county to do that. Uh, it's really their responsibility. It's not ours. But it's sort of like the whole CERT program. If we didn't do it, I can guarantee you it wouldn't get done. Even though it's the legal responsibility of the city and town to do CERT, if we weren't taking the leadership role and putting the resources into it, nothing would have happened there. And so with respect to item 23, my proposal is that we put this on our agenda in March to have a discussion and to begin to give staff direction as to whether or not this is something that they should put time and attention to, uh, what sort of a schedule we think is appropriate. Um, I don't see us making a decision at the March meeting to buy this or do that, but simply to provide direction to staff as to how to proceed. So that's my proposal. Uh, Robert, yeah, you, you want to add some things to that too. Right? Yes, I do. Um, and I'm kind of maybe I'm a little confused here a little bit. And, and please just help me with the clarity. Um, at the our, the emergency preparedness committee meeting, that particular item was on the agenda. So, so the confusion on my part is that, and, and I think the board really needs to talk about that. Uh, in a more broader perspective. So, so help me on the clarity. Is, is that something that is kicked into the the uh, disaster preparedness committee's 
domain to kind of work up and look at and come to come back to the board with certain uh, information. Well, because we had talked to Chief Stevens about going away, investigating the this particular line item, um, what that alert system should look like. Everyone is aware of the Welsh Road. So I had a chief actually took me up there and I had a chance to take a look at it. And I thought it was absolutely great, not only for where it's at, but throughout the district. And I know in other areas, like East Palo Alto, but that's been a topic of conversation. So my, and I need to help in terms of as a board member that's currently chairing the Emergency Preparedness Committee, is that one of the things you want us to look at, or should we just kind of, kind of step back and allow the, the chief Stevens to do his thing and then bring it to the full board. I'm not sure how you want us to massage it. So some type of direction to the committee would be helpful. Because we did ask him to go. We started talking about it, but we, we couldn't really hold a television conversation. I couldn't. Uh, maybe Rod had some more information than I do to really understand what the system was all about, how it was put together, and how what plan could be put together to, to, to not only for, for for the rest of Athens, but all of the district. So that's what we asked them to do. Uh, and so hopefully at the next board meeting, it's going to come back with that information. And so you know, we can report at the next board meeting uh, what we come up with, but if you want, and still have the conversation at the board level. So if there's more information that you think is necessary that we need to investigate with the chief, then, then let me know as chairperson or or just give me a direction which way you should are, are you saying at the next, it's on your agenda for the next meeting? For the next, in, and in so, March. And Chief Stevens is bringing information in, in, back? That's what the charge we gave you. Okay. Correct. Help me, Michelle, you there. Help me, Rob, you there. Yo, yes. Uh, we had, in fact, there were some other items too uh, that we had gone over with the chief in our meeting. Uh, that, you know, we, we talked about not meeting monthly. But let's, let's focus on the alerts. Let's let's the alerts. Let's let's alerts. Let's motion on the on table. Peter's yeah. motion. Well, so I mean, is there I'm, a second I'm just trying to report motion? on that we met. Well, but the, I, the, alert, the alert system, anything to add to what Robert had to say? No. Well, I, I think from the joint meeting with Atherton, it's an important issue. So I don't, did you get a second on your motion? He didn't, he didn't make a motion yet. So, just, that's his proposal. Well, real quick, oh, sorry, you know, hopefully your conversation. We've already been working on this at staff. Yeah. So ever since we had the applicant meeting, we've been working yeah. on it. We have vendors identified. We're looking at systems. We're talking about district-wide because that's what the board has said they wanted to see. So, and they'll report it back out to the committee. You can do it as the full board. But, you know, we pretty much understood that this was something. A, we're trying to improve the Walsh Road siren, which is underperforming for what we would like. We've known that for a while. So we're looking at different systems that can hopefully overperform and, you know, and didn't do it on a uniform basis across the entire district. Is that modulars on trailers? Is that fixed? How many fixed locations? What else does it do? How much does it cost? I mean, we're, we're actually just working on all that stuff right now. I think, let me just ask Robert. Robert, at one of the committee meetings, didn't somebody present information about that there's there's still some of that left in East Palo Alto in various places or up on poles or that there are the some... The civil defense system. There's an old civil defense system the civil still there? Station 4 has a, has a civil defense siren up there too. But the new stuff that's, that's out there is, it's called LRAD and the military has been using it in different places. They can use it for a, as a warfare agent, or they can use it for a you know, communications tool. And you can use it, which is now the civilian application, to deal with actually different types of threats. So you know, different sounds, actually verbal communications. So we could, we could differentiate you know, between a fire, say, and a you know, right. we, we, you know, are we going to have a discussion now, or are we going to have? You know, well, I'm trying to understand well, what we're going to talk about. Well, okay. well, but it's all I, it's written down here. Right. You know. So discussion of a district-wide emergency alert system. And we'll get input from the committee. We're going to get input from the staff. You know, look at our budget, folks. There's nothing in our budget to focus on this. Nothing. Zero. Right. So we made a commitment at the Atherton meeting that we were going to do something about this. 
I would like us to follow up on that commitment. One of the ways to do that is to put this on our agenda and talk about it and give direction to staff based on input right. that they get from the committee and other people. Would you like to make so a motion? So are you making a motion? motion? Yes. Okay. I'll second it. Okay, so we have a motion and a second on the floor to discuss this. Any further discussion? Well, I just want to is there anything that you want the committee within this scope to look at other than what, what maybe the chief have in terms of information and setting the what they've been uh, preparing so far. Is there anything beyond beyond that related to this item? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, question. I don't think I don't think we, don't think we know enough to know. So I would say functionally, it would be we'll go back through e prep if we're ready by that point, and then from e prep it goes to the full board, and then that's where you have the broader. I think it's all actually in line. But yeah, we've been ever since the afternoon meeting we've been working on trying to identify vendors and capabilities. But I, I would just like to add the issue. I, I hope you will have a discussion of who, who triggers the alarm. Because Peter was suggested there was a police function, and I sure wouldn't want to turn this over to the police for any reason. So I'd like, I'd like that's to. That's actually the way it works now in Ashton, because evacuation is a law enforcement function. Yeah, that's a legal right. issue, which will be included in the staff report. Right? Well, but anyway, that's why I'd like to have the discussion at the committee meeting. Right, but that's, that's, if we get this on the next agenda, we can also yeah. have this. Right, so right. we have a motion and, and a second. That would be part of the report, so who knows? Yeah. Okay. I say, I, uh, it, it, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, the second item is the neighborhood evacuation planning. Yes, our, I'll make a motion that at our March meeting we discuss what direction we want to give to staff on developing, in concert with our partner agencies, neighborhood evacuation plans. And let me be clear, I'm not talking about mass evacuations, I'm talking about micro evacuations, neighborhood by neighborhood. And we don't have those plans for the vast majority of the district, and we know from looking at other disasters that in the absence of those kinds of plans, there are going to be serious problems. Uh, there's going to be conflicts between people trying to leave areas and emergency responders trying to enter, etc. So my motion is that we receive a staff report on this at the next meeting and decide what direction, if any, to give the staff on moving forward on this. Are there plans or are the plans already? Did you, you made the motion. Is there I'll a second? second? Okay, a second. There's okay. one plan for Walsh Road, uh, which I wrote with a group of citizens, and which was later adopted by the, the fire district and very reluctantly adopted by the town of Africa. But it's now in place and it works. It that's online? the only neighborhood for which we have an evacuation plan. Is it online? I can go online to this site. Uh, there's a brochure which describes it, which has been distributed to all the neighborhoods, uh, which I paid for. Um, and there are signs that have been put up by the town that show where the evacuation routes are. Um, I mean, I'd love to get, a, uh, get my eyes on to look at it if I can. Peter, is it in the Atherton handbook that they just put out? They put an updated out on. Um, they distribute that to all residents, and when yeah. I looked at my copy, I didn't see anything specific not in to Walsh Road. <clears throat> what we did really, when we did that plan is that we found a, a community in Southern California that had done a wonderful plan. I found the person who did the maps and the graphics, hired that person, and then with a lot of help from individuals within the fire district, we went out and identified routes, Cal Water was really helpful. We put it all together. Um, it was an orphan though. You know, nobody wanted to own it until we got finished with it and then we got people to buy into it. Sadly, nothing has happened since then for any other part of the district. And I think for you know, East Palo, just every, every, I think every neighborhood. You know, I worry about Lindenwood. Lindenwood's a fire trap. Uh, it's got a two and a half mile wall around it. And you know, we're gonna end up with, if you have a big fire there, you're gonna end up with dead bodies against the wall. Yeah. I would love to take a look at that plan because 
we have over the last two and a half years, my group and we've also been looking at a neighborhood, uh, what that what that plan will look like, and we have done some research, surprisingly, of the two uh, city of Los Angeles up in the I think I forgot what district it is, closer to downtown LA, and then there was another one in Orange County we looked at. So. I mean, we've been trying to check away at it, but it would be great to see what you, you guys have put together. So we talk about it at the EPRF meeting. Kind of, but I think that's what the, the third board, one of their charges, is to try and to gather or put together some type of plan, citizen tree plan for, for uh, neighborhoods. Uh, so it'll work out perfect. I'm not sure it's the most current version. But I'll send it to you. Okay. It's called the Walsh Road Evacuation Plan. Okay, cool. I, I, I think there are some other evacuation plans that maybe you could look at at the E-Prep meeting too. Yeah. We saw the ones the Ryan the Ryan Zollicoffer had prepared and so mm -hmm. forth. That's the one where we evacuate to the San Mateo River or whatever it is, which doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, oh, right. That but, is that. But, um, so there are some plans. Most of the police departments have kept them secret, though, uh, because you wouldn't want people to evacuate when they need to for some reason. But um, they do they do exist. So Ryan's a, a good uh, Ryan. resource. Yeah, it's yeah. I'm sure you maybe you don't know this, but you know it's the IKEA garage, right? The elevated the garage area. It's the Four Seasons garage. I mean, that's better than what it used to be, which is nobody, nobody knew where they were going to go. Right? But that's a that's a well kept secret. <laughs> now, I, I, I don't know why, but it's not that big of a secret. I don't know either. I don't know either. At least you get the meatballs you could. But that's that's yeah, why I, I, I don't like the police departments. I mean, I think they have failed us in every single disaster that's occurred uh, up north in the fires, in, in in Napa when they had the earthquake, in San Jose when they had the flood. They no warnings have gone out. The police always have a good reason. They don't want to panic people, they'd rather let them drown or something. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what, it, but it's inconceivable. They're just, you know, super the secret. The thing to remember, and I tell them all the time, is if you don't get people out, that's when we go to work. Right. And it makes our job more difficult, because then we're doing rescues. Right. Okay, okay. Um, so Peter, those are your two things. Those are my two things. Um, I wanted to bring up the issue of... Do we need to vote Oh, I'm sorry, yes, I thought we had. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Motion, aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Five zero. Um, I would like to bring up the issue again. The board has approved an expenditure for a public relations firm to publicize CERT and volunteer and so forth. We set aside over a three-year period half a million dollars to do that. We've not spent a dime on it yet. And I'd like to bring up the idea of using a professional agency to create both awareness in the community and um, attendance or uh, sign-ups for training, CERT training. I, we need, I've talked to, uh, to uh, Tom about this, we need to fully make CERT functional about a hundred more volunteers. I mean, I think we could get a lot more than that, but I, I think we need the help of somebody that creates awareness of it and does it on a consistent basis. It just the district, I, I'm not blaming the district, it's not their specialty, it would be the advertising agency or something like that. And I think we need the help of somebody that knows how to plan a campaign to boost certain membership. And uh, so, so I'd, like to make a, I'd like to make a motion that we um, look at the CERT marketing plan that the board approved four years ago and um, discuss the expenditure of funds to make that happen. Second. Any further discussion? Rob? Yeah, I would just like to uh, see actually what, what staffing and individuals that are in place already to do that before we turn it over to, to, a, to a public relations group. So you're on you're on each prep. You could put it on your agenda for Mike Ralston because that's who's responsible for this. To get so, the update where he is. So what are you looking for? 
Well, I, before we go outside to a, to a uh, contractor or some type of press relations group, I, want you, I just want to see what type of resources we have within the district before we use Right. Uh, spend them. You know, we could use that money on handouts, maybe, Chuck. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. You know, to that are needed for the for the CERT program. You know, and maybe that money can be spent preparing those handouts or preparing uh, professional trainers to prepare those handouts for our CERT and for our community. Then paying a public relations firm to put in a bunch of newspapers. So I I understood. Director Bernstein's motion to be a discussion of how we should publicize it, not focusing in on a particular way to do it. That's right. that's correct. Right. So that your part could be discussed in this during. If, well, that's if, fine. If, if if we want to see just that, uh, I I just want us us to explore our all avenues before we start spending any more money on. It. I, I think it, the there's a valid point on to who mentioned it that first we need to understand what resources are available um, so that you know we may not have enough money to go out and hire a firm but we may right. and see see what has worked in the past and what may have fell short now history I, you know there is a there is a from what I see there is a identity gap or branding gap within the CERT right now in the community. Uh, certain communities have had more of the branding than others. So I think in terms of understanding that, um, you know, I mean, I think that could be very important. I know we experience it in East Palo Alto uh, a lot. Uh, and so Menlo Park, even though it, Menlo, the station and the district has been here and it's, there's a lot of branding that went on here at the various events, but you know, after a while, sometimes when people walk past a, a doorknob, you know, they forget all about the doorknob. It's just kind of one of those things. They just so you turn it. So some type of re-energizing need to take place, and that could bring in someone, or as it could be done internally within the, within the fire district. So maybe somebody like Michelle has bright ideas, and she might just want to let it go. You know, I mean, you never know how, how that would work. But I think we do do need to explore it in terms of understanding the resources right. and how it has been working. And I think Chuck's motion would include that. Yes, my intention was right. to talk about the whole right. marketing right. of it. Right. Yeah, and I not be say it's not a fair statement specific. to say we're not a marketing entity. Right. So I mean, we would need professional assistance if that's what you choose to do. But I'll give you the best we'll marketing the is an event, right? I mean, we get more people that sign up for anything after there's a real event. But that's know. a little late, so. So there's. Well, let me, let me add to that point. I think that um, the Chief Stevens had mentioned the best marketers for what we're doing in some ways are the firefighters. Yeah. And it, but that, that needs to be part of a plan right. where somebody does that. Yeah. Any further discussion before we vote? All in favor of putting it on the agenda? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay. And then I had one more thing that I'd like to put on. I hope th this is not a pet project, but I think it's not clear to me what our procedure is as a board about expenditures for board training expenses and attendance at meetings. It's in the board policy manual. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't, I, it's, not, it's not clear. So for example, a, a board member has requested attendance at something and I received a copy of it, the chief receives a copy of it. I'm not sure who decides. Like who, who does, gets to who go does to the conference? The way I read the port policy manual, that's a decision made by the president. You can report it to the board, or you can bring it to the board if you want concurrence. But my recollection of the language in the board policy manual is that travel and training expenditures uh, require a board member to submit a request to you, and I believe. You know, I can look the language up right now, but I mean... But let me just say, I followed up... Well, we don't need to discuss it okay. now. If you want to put it on the agenda, we can, that's the perfect way to place to discuss it. Okay. Um, the, the, the conflict is, I don't believe we have a budget for it, so I don't know what I'm supposed to do in that situation. So that's why we'd like to discuss it, just to get clarity. So some of the training I thought that we had it. 
Pardon? Some of those things were eliminated when we went into the recessionary times. Yeah. I mean, you guys had a statement, it's no comfort, so that meant, yeah. you know, you're not getting food. food I mean, right. yeah. different I things like that, that, which you may want to rethink based upon some of the meetings and how long they go, too. So, I brought my chair. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you have vending machines in there, <laughs> could could we get a, a staff report that made a rec some recommend options or recommendations? Or yeah, yeah, we could go back and, and, and cite some of the things that you did before. You did have a budget before. You did do different things, and I think you know even in prioritization. I know you had asked me about well, what directors go to what. You know, there used to be at least somewhat of a rotation that all the directors was trying to get them to go to a CSDA conference, especially during ledge days, so that they could go up and walk the hill, become familiar with the legislators, go to a CSDA conference, which is extremely beneficial, and rotate that around. Well, you know, but, but, Chuck, can I yes. Well, Joe well, nominated me to be on the CSDA executive yeah. board, and I want which is new, which is a new thing, and. You know, if, if the board doesn't want me to attend these things and not compensate me for appropriately, I'll resign. I mean, you know, you nominated me for the position. I, I won the vote of the Bay Area group. And then if I want to go to these training conferences in order to represent not only the district, but uh, the California Special District Association and the, the general populace and then have a benefit for the district, well, that's fine. But then if you don't, want to compensate the board members for going to these things, but then well, I, what I the mean... the board has had, though, for a while, though, was the... Yeah, but we haven't had... In case there was sure. things that... Right. I, I would just like to have a discussion so that it's clear... Then I don't think we should have a discussion. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just like to make a point that when you look at the board policy manual, the responsibility for setting the agenda for this board rests jointly with the president and the fire chief. We have a mechanism for other board members, other than the president, to bring items up and propose them for the agenda. I think it would be a serious mistake to start down the road where every time the president wants to put something on the agenda, he has to bring it here for a meeting before it gets on the agenda. You know, it's his job to set our agenda working with the president. And, you know, I rely on him to do that job. And I don't want us to put things off for a month or two months going through this preliminary process because that's not what the policy manual says. The policy manual says that the agenda is put together by the fire chief and the board president. And they don't need anybody's approval to do that. Okay. The relationship to this training at on 3.2, talking about training education conferences, it, it says that prior approval for expenses necessary will be made by the board president or his or her designee in constant consultation with the prior team. Yeah. Okay. My recollection was correct. Thank you. And, and when a director submits invoices, like you're just on your panel. Okay. So, so sorry. Uh, uh, I, I, but I would still like some more guidelines. So I would like this on the agenda. Let me take the vote. I, I'm going to make the motion that we put it on. It's going to have a second. Second. Okay. All in favor of then putting on the agenda? What's your vote again? To, to put this item on the agenda for discussion. This one policy item? Yes. Yeah. Again, I would I, like to make the point. I think it's a serious mistake to go down the road of putting items like this that the president wants to discuss up for a vote as to whether or not it doesn't go on the agenda. It sets a precedent that he can't put anything on the agenda that doesn't come here. And that's just not an effective way to run this organization. You know, I'll vote against the motion. I think it's unwise. I think it's a bad precedent. He has the authority to put on the agenda. You need to have the authority to do that as president. You really do. Well, I mean, we've seen abuse of that, too. So. Wait, wait, I, 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 so what, what, I, what he's, I don't understand what the point is. Excuse me. But wait, wait, you know what? Let, let, I, I let, let, let's stop this. Virginia, you're out of order here. Okay. I'm trying to. Yeah. You're, you're talking about, you, Rob, you're talking about need the authority to put things on the agenda. Is that right? Well, not only that, but to make those decisions like these training okay. issues and well, things like that. Let me not make it. I'd like a consensus that people are okay discussing this, given that it's your time as well as mine. 
Does anybody disagree with putting this on the agenda? Let me do it that way. We don't need a consensus on it. It's your job to put the agenda together. Do it. Okay. Just okay, well, okay, I'm going to move then. Uh, we, actually, we have no more items. Um, there are, I'm not clear on what just happened there. <laughs> nothing, nothing happened. So nothing, happened. <laughs> nothing, nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Right. So we had a discussion and nothing happened. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So we can talk about that um, after the meeting. Can I um, clarify something with you that you said earlier you wanted on the March agenda? Was that to remove Director Crawley? As the liaison and put Robert Jones on. Is that for Sanford? I can't pronounce it. Sanford? No. no, it's for the, the ALSJTA. Thank you. Thank you. So that's um, Which Robert, we should talk about because that's a big deal. So yeah, I, I, I we have a number of committee meetings scheduled here. It's up to the chairs if those times are not convenient to, to okay. redo that. March 6th. I'd like to consult with you and see if we can do that on the afternoon of March 5th. Can we talk about it just when we finish just up just right here? Give me a heads up. Okay, thank you. And that anybody else arrange for an alternate time if you need to, to have no. your meetings? I'll email you. Okay. Okay, thank you. And um, could I have a motion to adjourn? Oh, I'm sorry, I need a, I need a public, public comment, comment number two. Any public comment? Okay, a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Move and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh